Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Valeria Alarcón, Executive Director here at the New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils, who along with uh, County and Tribal Health Councils and our legislative partners and community partners, we've curated today's gathering. Before I, I do welcoming, I do wanna say that we are thinking of our dear communities who are affected by the fires um, and sending prayers of safety to our community members and animals, of course, um, in those regions affected by the fire. But may everyone be safe and may rain come to New Mexico as soon as possible. So we welcome you all today to the inauguration of New Mexico's first legislative uh, and Health Council Summit. We're thrilled to have you here today for what promises to be an informative and empowering gathering. This summit marks a pivotal moment in our collective efforts to advance health equity and strengthen community well being across our state. We each have a part in that. Today, we bring together dedicated health advocates, public health professionals, key partners, and visionary policymakers united by a common goal to create a healthier, thriving, and more resilient New Mexico. So over the next three hours, we will be learning from our communities, health councils. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to share innovative solutions and forge powerful partnerships. Your presence here is a testament of your dedication and commitment to making a positive and meaningful impact. And we're so excited to collaborate with you. So thank you for joining us in this moment on this journey. And I know that together we can achieve remarkable outcomes for the health and well being of New Mexico at large. So we want to take uh, a minute here, and, and I'm seeing folks are joining. We have about 42 special guests joining us today. Thank you again for uh, carving out time to be here in this space with us. Um, as a way to see who's in the room, given that this is a webinar setting, um, we want to introduce a state map activity. So here shortly, you're going to see a, um, a link in the chat. Uh, our dear friend, Anna Horner, is going to be including a link in the chat. And when that link opens up for you, you want to select a category that uh, identifies you, your affiliation, you know, legislator, community member, um, uh, health council, state agency. Um, and so you can include uh, the indicator that identifies you. You can include your zip code. In this way, we will have a visual way to see who's in the room joining us from which parts of our beautiful state. Um, every so often here, uh, our friend Sam Henning, who's our comms lead, will be refreshing the page. Let's take a look at the chat. And we have a couple questions, I think. Uh, okay, um, we have Sephora, who's raised her hand. And then I believe Representative Liz Thompson. Go ahead, Sephora. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I didn't realize I had raised my hand. I was oh, trying to do the survey. I got you. Thank you. And Sephora um, is our dear, dear friend, director of New Mexico Thrives. You'll be uh, facilitating a segment of this uh, convening today. Um, so no worries. I know we're all getting acquainted. All of us are getting acquainted with this tool. So it looks like we have, and Sam, as you have eyes, my little eyes can't see the tiny print, but we have folks joining us from the Northwest side of the state, the Northeast, the Metro area. We also have uh, community members from our tribal communities, Pueblos and nations. Um, so we're really thrilled to have you with us. Um, uh, Anna or Sam, can you tell me which the turquoise or, or yellow in terms of representation who we have here? 
Okay. Uh, we have some county and tribal health coordinators um, from Quay, San Miguel, Otero, um, up in Nambe, Acoma, and then we have some um, government representation in San Juan, uh, Santa Fe as well. Um, Beautiful. Thank you, Sam. Um, and I believe Representative Liz Thompson has her hand up. How can we be of assistance? I see, yes, um, remarks. Give me one second, just to let her know, 10.45, 10.45 a.m. Uh, is your, okay, so thank you, Representative Liz Thompson. Yes, we so appreciate you being here and please um, look forward to having you here uh, during your segment uh, for remarks around 10 30. Um, so as we can see we're 44 strong here today representing various areas of New Mexico. Thank you for sh showing up. Thank you for your dedication um, and for uh, being here with all of us. Um, as noted this webinar is being recorded uh, but please know that we will be sharing this recording along with slide decks and the jam board and handouts with you post the summit. And I'd love to share with you next sort of like the purpose of uh, why NMHC. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you for queuing me up, uh, Sam. Let's go back to the land acknowledgement. Let's begin there. Um, the New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils humbly recognizes and acknowledges we are on unceded territory and ancestral lands of the original peoples of New Mexico's pueblos, Apache Nations, and the Navajo Nation. Together, we acknowledge the history of genocide, dispossession, colonization, and ongoing systemic inequities while strengthening and respecting relationships with indigenous peoples. We give thanks to the past, present, and future stewards of this land and respect all tribal nations' sovereignty. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous resiliency self-determination and self-governance of New Mexico's tribes and nations who are still here today. Thank you, Sam. So the purpose of this convening, uh, NMHC, the New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils is the backbone organization to county and tribal health councils. And a main uh, part of our mission is to advocate on their behalf. And so these summits today and Mondays, the same programming, uh, serve as a pivotal opportunity to learn from our communities, to learn from county and tribal health councils, to have the space to engage in some solution-driven uh, uh, ideas, um, recommendations around advancing health equity and improving population health. And it's truly at the heart of these summits is to show how deeply aligned Essentially, we all are, right, in terms of community priorities, priorities, legislative priorities, state agency priorities. I think we all have a shared, shared commitment um, to improving the health, well-being, and quality of life of everyone in our state. And so together, we're aiming to co-develop a roadmap with statewide partners who are here today that reflects community values for sustainable change in a healthier New Mexico. So we're very excited to have you here today in this space. Um, before we begin with the actual programming, I wanna share some logistical uh, aspects of the webinar. Um, we ask that you kindly select the hide uh, non-video participants. Um, apologies, one second. Okay, um, while we wait for Representative Thompson to come back and join us, um, just wanna go over some logistics. So if you kindly on the upper right-hand side of your Zoom uh, video, there is a non-video, high non-video participants. That's what you want to choose. This way um, you will see the, the presenter who's being spotlighted. 
Um, again, we have a three hour summit and we do welcome your questions. We do ask that you include your questions in the Q&A uh, option of the webinar. We'll have our team member, Anna Horner, managing the Q&A. We wanna be able to also capture those questions and answers so that we can share them with you post the event. Um, we will also prompt you to um, turn to the chat for accessing specific uh, uh, web links that we'll be sharing with you. So um, up next, we're gonna bring uh, Representative Liz Thompson, who will be spotlighted in a moment. And I just wanna acknowledge Representative Liz Thompson, of course, Representative Allison, on behalf of all of us, County and Tribal Health Councils, uh, for your steadfast leadership, for championing, uh, for state funding for health councils during the 2024 legislative session. We would not be here without you. So thank you, thank you for your support. And of course, our many thanks to Governor Grisham, to Representative Small and members of House Appropriation, and to the Department of Health who worked together to secure a one-time funding for health councils to continue to serve communities as they have for over 30 years. So with that, it is an honor to introduce you, Representative Liz Thompson. Um, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being such a strong proponent of County and Tribal Health Councils and for your dedication to improving quality of life and well-being for all of New Mexico. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And first, I want to start off by thanking all of you who are on this webinar. Um, you are the workhorses. You may not be the show horses that we see in the newspapers or on the TV getting interviewed about things. And I personally um, appreciate workhorses so much. I, I view myself as a workhorse. It's not, we probably all know that there's not much glory. There's definitely not a lot of money in doing the work that we're doing, but we're doing it because we love New Mexico and we love our fellow New Mexicans. So just really quickly, um, just a little bit about myself to tell you where I come from. Um, so I'm a pediatric physical therapist. I'm retired now. Uh, I spent 35 plus years working with kids with um, developmental disabilities in schools and Head Start, child cares, and at home. I grew up on the Eastern Navajo Reservation in Crown Point. Um, I have what really brought me to the legislature is my own son, Eric, who is now 33, who was diagnosed with severe autism when he was three. Um, and I began to advocate for him and realized that um, we needed some systems change at the state level. So I decided to run. And I do chair, um, sorry about that. I do chair the House Health and Human Services Committee during the session. And in the interim, I am the vice chair of the Legislative Health and Human Services Committee. I will be chairing that for the next two years, starting in 25. So just so the one thing that I always talk about with with um, tribal and county health councils is that most states have their public health in a county based system. New Mexico has it in a state based system. So we we depend on the councils to keep us up to date about what's happening, to tell us about trends, to tell us about needs. And that's why the work that you all do is so important because in Santa Fe, we can't possibly know what's going on in Acoma Reservation. We can't possibly know what's going on in JAL, New Mexico in terms of public health. So you are our eyes and our ears and our hands and our feet to um, take care, to give us information on, on what's going on in your communities. And we can't really, um, we can't fix the problem or, or lift up someone that's doing well if we don't know about it. So it's greatly appreciated. And I know personally how important it is to have people on the ground. Um, you all know your communities. You know that maybe, you know, things that may not show up on a, a survey or a study for a year or two when the data comes in, in terms of, let's say, you know, the increase in syphilis or whatever it might be, you know that from your communities, you don't have to wait till the annual report or the semi, you know, the, the report when the data comes out two years later. 
no one else can do what you do. Um, no one in Santa Fe can do it. No one in another county or, or tribal community um, can do what you do. And so we depend on you. I know that it's mostly a thankless job. It's a lot of work for no pay, um, but I can totally relate to that. Um, and as I said, you all know who the show horses are and who the work horses are. So when it comes time for Channel 4 to do an interview, you know who they're going to call up and who they're going to talk to. And that probably is not any of you because you are out there doing the work, not, not, uh, and I won't say promoting yourself. I'm not that, not saying that, but, but you also know who is in the trenches, who is getting their hands dirty, who really knows it, not from a 30,000 foot level, but from a, a ground level perspective. And that's, that's a perspective that we can't get anywhere else. So we depend on you. Um, we've been trying to get you more money. We were about halfway successful this year, which, um, you know, 3 million is definitely better than what you had, but we're still going to work for that 6 million. And probably by the time um, we get the 6 million, you'll need nine or 12, but we're going to just keep on working. And on that, I really want to thank my colleague and mentee, uh, Representative Anthony Allison, who sadly is retiring from the legislature, but is, has told people that he will mentor his successor. So I'm very excited about that. But he really has taken the lead on this. I was I took the lead for a while and I have so many things on my plate. He took the lead and I kind of um, cheered him on and took over when he wasn't able to do it. But we, we really owe a lot to uh, Representative Allison. Um, and then just now with the fires going on in the Rio Doso area, you folks are the ones that we really, really depend on to let us know what you need. Uh, you know, people may send you pallets of water and that's not what you need. So we we need to hear from you. Um, the people who are helping out need to hear from you and your groups about what it is that you really need. That I mean, there's some obvious things that everybody jumps to. Um, and there's been a lot of coverage about animals, um, which without that coverage, most people wouldn't think about, about how many, you know, the racehorses and the the pets and everything, the riding horses, all of those things that needed to get out there too. So again, we depend on you. Um, and I think with that, I, well, I will say one more thing. I will say that Val is, is a wonderful leader. Um, she is persistent to the point of being a nag. And I find that refreshing. And, um, and I mean nag in the most friendly way because I consider myself a nag too that if you just say things and people don't respond and you just let it go nothing ever happens so she's always on top of things she's always trying to get public some public information out doing a radio show doing a doing this kind of thing so you're lucky that you have Val um, and I enjoy working with her and I will enjoy working with all of you as um as things move forward and please know that I'm a champion for you. I'm a champion for healthcare in New Mexico and my door is always open. My phone number on the web, on the legislative website is my cell phone number. So um, if you have great ideas for legislation or things that you want someone to know, please feel free to reach out to me. And thank you again for the invitation to join you. And I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Liz Thompson. Um, I've been called a lot of things I love. <laughs> Being a nag for a good cause, I'm right there with you, shoulder to shoulder, and with my team. And I got to say that, um, you know, for me, this is not a job. This is not a, a job title. This is my life's mission and passion. And and taking a stand for and with our communities is the most important thing. Is what gets me out of bed in the morning and what makes me sleep in good conscience at night. And I feel deeply humbled and honored to be in this space 
with all of you in service of New Mexico. So thank you for your dedication, your steadfast leadership, Representative Liz Thompson, and I. we look forward to continued in our partnership to, to serve our communities. Me too. Thank you. All right, my dear friends. So um, we're gonna give you a quick overview of um, our agenda for today. So you have a sense of what's, what's coming our way. We're gonna um, provide an overview of New Mexico's county and tribal health councils. I think it's important to understand who they are, their in instrumental role at the local and systems level in partnership with DOH and many other key partners. Um, we're also going to highlight how deeply collaborative they are at the local and systems level. Um, we're going to highlight the how deeply aligned um, community and legis legislative and governor community uh, legislative priorities are and how health is at the intersection of everything and the work that health councils are driving around this deeply aligned set of priorities. And then we're going to have space together uh, facilitated by our dear friend Sephora uh, on a pathway forward, right? Um, where, where do we need to invest? How do we get to work together to actualize a healthy and thriving New Mexico and ensure that health equity is a reality for everyone? So with that, I want to give a little disclaimer that some of the presentations are a bit content and data centric but this is because it's a reflection of the robust and, and multidisciplinary work of health councils. So bear with us, we will touch on you know, key elements, high level, and then we'll share the slide deck and handouts with you after the summit so you can do a little deep dive on the content. And of course, we're here to answer any questions you may have. So with that, I'd love to welcome Geraldine Antonio, a member of the Diné Nation, she is the tribal liaison at the New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils and is deeply committed and passionate about serving and supporting tribal communities, nations, and pueblos across New Mexico. So join me in welcoming Geraldine Antonio. Hello, Yate. I'm just gonna do a quick introduction. Um Yat A She A Jerlin Antonio Yanshe Nanish Eja Tatini Nishle To Bajna Aja Bashishin Ashihin Dashinala Ado Glashe Dashiche. And so um I'm from the Navajo Nation and yes, very happy to be here with you all. I'll be giving the overview for this next section here, and we'll go ahead and get started with our overview of a map of our county and tribal health councils. And so currently there are 33 county health councils right now, which means there's one in every county in our state. And um, we have 10 tribal health councils. And so if you've been following the work of um, the health council world, <laughs> we, uh, if you last heard, we had nine tribal health councils and so happy to announce that we just developed a new partnership um, with the Pueblo of Santa Ana. And so they're our newest tribal health council, um, which brings us up to 10 and 43 statewide right now. Um, what's also great right now too is the Pueblo of Powake is also interested in developing a health council. And so there is interest in our tribal communities, which I'm happy to announce. And um, yes, yeah, just so happy to build those partnerships um, between the Alliance and also Department of Health promotion um, as we kind of engage new tribal communities um, to the health council world. And so this is just an overview map of, um, you know, the statewide health councils. And on the right here, you can see um, the list of tribal health councils. We currently have nine Pueblos right now. And so, um, and one tribe, um, Navajo community, which is out in Tohajili. So um, there is plenty. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the Alliance has plenty of work to do in partnering with our Apache nations and the Navajo nation as well. Um, and so that is something we're currently working with it right now. Um, there's a lot of relationship building right now, which needs to happen, and that's totally fine. Um, we've had some tribal communities who had just said, no, right now is not the time. So yeah, always keeping an open eye and ears to some of those new partnerships. Um, and so the next slide, I'll go ahead and just give some context to the functions of 
county and tribal health councils. As you all know, we always reference House Bill 137. Um, and, and so health councils actually have been in existence since the 1990s under the Maternal and Child Health Care Act. And it wasn't until 2019 that the act was amended um, to specifically outline the functions of county and tribal health councils. And um, they are actually all community-based um, councils and their structures look very different statewide. Um, before I give context to the functions, um, statewide health councils could be, um, they fall under four governance structures. Um, they could be a nonprofit, um, they can fall under county government, tribal government, or uh, fiscal sponsorships. And so um, the four structures will look different, you know, across the state and each health council you may engage with, that, that's going to look different. Um, and membership um, pretty much for each health council, again, um, varies. And so you'll have um, to give context for tribal communities or tribal health councils, they may partner internally with their own tribal programs. And, um, you know, our county health councils may work with their own county programs. But what's in most important about the structures and membership is that it includes community voices and community membership. And so um, just to keep that in mind, uh, a lot of this work is done in, in partnership with community, but also, um, you know, getting community feedback is also um, a major plus out of this work here. But the functions outlined under um, 2019 County and Tribal Health Councils Act is um, they are encouraged to do um, assessments. And so uh, community health assessments through the form of surveys, interviews, um, maybe hosting forums. And so whatever that looks like for the health council and depending on the structure, um, that is something health councils are tasked with. And health councils actually have been doing an amazing job at this. And I'll give some context to that in a few slides about some of the work they're doing around assessments and planning. Um, another function is for them to also go through a planning process. So um, just recently, health councils did a planning process, you know, to do data collection, um, identify their short and long term goals, the action steps, metrics, you know, what are we going to measure as we go through this process? And then ultimately, what do we want our outcomes to be? So that is something um, part of their functions. Um, another thing to, that health councils are also tasked with task with is to also look at their community um, programs and services. So, um, you know, doing a mapping of this is really helpful in the community because one, you could look at wh where's the duplication in work, um, who are the other partners doing similar work, and also um, where are the gaps? You know, where can the health council play a role that maybe not much have not much attention has been given to, um, maybe around services or different programs. And so that's a role health councils can play in. Um, another function uh, is very uh, an easy one here is collaboration. So you know, encouraging partnerships, um, you know, statewide, um, locally, and you know, to sustain those partnerships as well. Um, and not just with our um, statewide partners, but with community. So, you know, as I had mentioned, how do we get community input and feedback? Um, and another function is to, um, you know, do some policy work. Um, that is something that we are supporting health councils in building capacity around, you know, how do you look uh, what existing policies are there in the community? Is there not a policy that um, exists, you know, as it relates to the health, um, the way policy affects health um, outcomes? So that looks different for every health council, but it's definitely something that health councils will be engaging in a little bit more. Um, and then lastly is just to communicate, you know, with your lo local jurisdictions, um, community members, you know, in the form of updates or maybe a newsletter. And so um, these are some of the primary functions of county and tribal health councils. Um, the State Tribal Collaboration Act. Um, that's our next bullet point here. And so why this is so important, um, it, it ultimately interfaces with the work of our county, uh, sorry, our tribal health councils. And essentially this um, 
State Tribal Collaboration Act is important um, just because there is definitely, uh, it, it looks at the way that our state agencies are being held accountable for a government to government um, relationship. And, and, you know, ultimately the way that our state agencies are engaging with tribal communities, um, specifically around expansion of resources and services. And this does um, interface with the work of tribal health councils um, because we are always advocating a, a, on behalf of our tribes, pueblos, and nations who are part of the health council world that, um, you know, they're, they're, the funding needs to be increased. And that's part of the government to government relations in, in this work here. So, um, you know, we always try to advocate on behalf of this act and, you know, just try to also advocate in spaces with state agencies on behalf of our tribal communities. If it's, um, you know, we need a data sharing agreement in place or we don't have access to the correct data or up-to-date data. Um, so some of those resources and advocating takes place. And in those spaces, we can um, give that information to our state agencies, specifically um, the tribal liaisons or the Native American li liaisons and some of the specific state agencies that we work with. And lastly, um, House Memorial 2. Uh, I know that um, this was you know, um, passed in 2019, but there was work done and, you know, from 2019 to 2022. And so this work is important around H um, House Memorial too, because they were tasked to develop a work group to provide recommendations um, to the legislation, but also to state agencies around how do we improve public health in New Mexico. And so this is important because of the recommendations that came out of HM2, health councils were um, part of the top five recommendations. And one of them being that we should, um, the state and should um, adequately fund health councils and support um, the po local public health infrastructures. And so through that, building capacity for health councils for planning and coordinating public health strategies. And so um, we just wanted to mention, you know, functions, but also supporting legislation uh, that affects health councils and the work that they do um, locally and, you know, statewide. Okay, so this next section here, I'm just gonna get into um, some of the functions around the Alliance and our partnership with DOH. And so um, the first slide here, I'll go ahead and give context to um, the Alliance and DOH. And so um, for educational purposes, the Alliance is a nonprofit, so a separate entity from state agency, um, whereas DOH is the state agency that supports health councils. And um, just a little bit of history, the reason the Alliance was developed in 2011 was to support health councils through advocacy. And in 2010, health councils were completely defunded um, to zero dollars. And so part of the Alliance's mission was to advocate to get the funding reinstated. And, um, you know, since 2011, it's definitely been, you know, a partnership with DOH and the Alliance to work together to provide support services. And so you'll see here, um, you know, the different support services provided by the state agency and the Alliance. And so the Alliance provides uh, ancillary support um, to health councils, and we do do this in partnership with DOH internally. Um, most importantly, we do a lot of advocacy, um, as Representative Liz Thompson had noted. Um, it's been something that we've been doing um, uh, strategically for the past three years. And we do work with DOH um, for uh, monthly reporting. And so gathering information um, on a monthly basis and you know, building on those data points to present to legislation um, and during the interim sessions and during the session as well. Uh, we both provide technical assistance to health councils. And um, in addition to that, just additional resources like Share New Mexico and our resource library that we just developed. And most importantly, the Alliance's role is to do, uh, 
to increase visibility of health councils as well. So you've probably seen our promotional materials, our announcements, our social media. So that's trying to give, um, you know, put health councils in the spotlight, which is really great. And DOH is and, you know, doing a lot of work with health promotion, um, supporting health councils that way. So there are currently um, five regions. And so they all have health promotion team members that support health councils as well. And so again, doing technical assistance, um, specifically to the functions I outlined earlier. And so, you know, around planning, assessment, um, policy work, data collection, doing evaluation. And so they'll provide a lot of that technical assistance as well, you know, through training and one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings. And most importantly, um, we both will provide opportunities for convenings uh, for health councils, may, uh, maybe through a statewide annual meeting or a regional meeting. And so it's really great that we get to work together to support health councils. And so my little diagram here in the middle, I'm not sure if you all have heard of DOH's North Star by 2040, um, but what we want to know is that DOH um, had announced the North Star that we want to be the healthiest state by 2040. And so to do that work, you know, means to, um, you know, really put resources and funding into our county and tribal health councils. You see, we're at the center here of this little infographic here. But essentially, county and tribal health councils have done um, community health assessments and community health improvement plans um, as outlined in the functions. But most importantly, this informs some of the work that DOH is doing around their strategic plan. Um, their FAB accreditation, which is their um, the Public Health Accreditation Board. And so this is something that happens, um, uh, I can't remember, maybe every three years. Sorry if I'm not correct, but so this, the work that health councils do, that, you know, they do, this informs a lot of what DOH is doing. And in addition to that, you know, a lot of these priorities fall under the governor's health priorities. And so to ultimately reach this North Star by 2040, we need to be sure that we are placing enough funding, resources, and supporting health councils the way that they should be supported um, as outlined in House Bill 137 to be able to achieve this North Star. And so it can't be done alone. You know, we rely so much on health councils and we can't ask them to do all this work without funding them the way they should be funded. And so, um, yeah, I like to think that this infographic is a really great way to show the impact health councils have and that they are the they are at the center of New Mexico's public health infrastructure. So the next slide here is just a quick poll. I know we kind of did an overview of functions, supporting legislation, um, but just, just to gauge the room here, we want to know if you know who your uh, local health council is. Could be county or tribal. And so feel free to answer the question here and it'll give us a sense of who has probably worked with their health council or maybe who someone who is new to the health council world and not quite sure so feel free to answer here all right sam nice okay so it looks like 93 percent of us know our local health council amazing and there's 7% who don't know. So that means I'm hoping that little overview gave you some knowledge about functions, who health councils are. And um, if not, you get to also um, hear some personal reflections here later today. So thank you for answering our little short poll. And we're gonna go ahead and go into our next section here. Um, so I know we talked about, you know, functions in an overview and health councils who are here all know that we had a CDC Kellogg grant for the past three years. And so um, at the time when the funding started, I believe that health councils were only funded um, through legislation and through the DOH at about maybe nine or 12,000. Um, so that means the CDC grant actually gave health councils an additional 50,000 um, for the last three years. And so this grant originally started because nationally there was the COVID pandemic. 
So year one, we focused a lot on building capacity um, to engage in COVID-19 emergency responses. And also health councils had the opportunity to um, focus on COVID-19 efforts, meaning health councils were actually the uh, at the front of the line doing a lot of this work, either hosting or co-hosting these events. So there were vaccination events, um, prevention education on um, COVID-19, there were quarantine efforts. So if someone tested positive, health councils were looking for places for families to quarantine. Uh, for example, like Santa Domingo was able to send um, community members to Buffalo Thunder. And so that's just an example. Our health councils were able to work with like a Motel 8. And so um, they were able to send health uh, community members there to quarantine. Um, delivery of essentials like food and water um, there were even health councils picking up medications for community members, uh, especially our elders and immunocompromised. Um, also doing transportation to medical appointments during COVID. And uh, another cool thing here is that there was traditional community-based healing events, not at the height of the pandemic, but as things kind of sizzled down a bit and there were still precautions with masks. Um, and I know this was very common in our tribal communities. There was a lot of healing events happening, um, grieving events, you know, uh, and so a lot of that took place with various traditional activities, um, prayer and song that was happening in outside spaces. Uh, for the families to come together. And um, as you can see here is a, as a, is a little data point. Um, through year one, health councils were able to reach over 345,000 community members with all of these events and activities listed above here. So you can see year one was uh, heavily focused on COVID-19. Um, year two, there was still continuation of vaccination events and education. Um, however, we started to go into um, the community rebuilding phase, you know, post the pandemic. So that was looking at how do we um, build a capacity again for health councils to engage in a community health assessment and a community health improvement plan. And so um, in collaboration with DOH health promotion teams, we were able to, um, you know, begin this process of supporting health councils with health assessments. Um, in addition to that, technical assistance and training specific, specifically to uh, assessments in, at, at the local level. Year three is where we started um, to use the data from the community health assessments and develop community health improvement plans. And so um, again, we've been able to identify health priorities um, in the last year. There's been implementation of community health improvement plans from health councils and just continuation of technical assistance and training for a lot of these needs. And um, most importantly, using this information to inform our legislators um, about some of the amazing work happening so we can advocate at the legislation at state legislature. So we've been able to do this in the past three years and the additional 50,000 that we got from CDC and Kellogg made this possible. And so forever grateful for that grant and been, been able to show amazing metrics and we got the one-time appropriation. Um, and so next slide here, a very high level overview of what the Alliance, the ancillary support we provide for health councils. Uh, one, building capacity. So although health councils have been working on community health assessments and community health improvement plans, um, there's always work being done around capacity building, you know, specifically to um, organizational development. And so, um, you know, there are health council, coordinator leadership changes, staff changes. There are always new members or maybe members leaving. And so there's always opportunity and growth for capacity building. This happens um, you know, throughout the process all year long. There's always support for that for health councils. Uh, most, you know, recently also been engaging in health equity needs. And so supporting that through our health councils talk and our health equity toolkit. Um, another really cool uh, initiative that the Alliance has been doing is peer learning sessions. And so that is to um, have health councils themselves share about um, some capacity to building areas, but how they're currently working on, on some of those areas, what are their challenges and what are those successes. And so that's to give a chance to 
um, do some storytelling with their local, uh, their peer health councils. So this is peer to peer and, and it gives them a chance to just, you know, connect with one another and to build those relationships as well. And so this peer learning session has been really amazing this past year. And I think health councils also really enjoyed it, you know, ask, ask, asking questions, relating to some of the ideas and challenges that other health councils are facing. Um, providing uh, opportunity for professional development. Um, and uh, most importantly, I think through this process with the community health assessments, community health improvement plans, how do we um, uh, work with Department of Health, you know, and looking at our roles in supporting health councils. And so it has worked out really great. You know, we've done a community health assessment. They have done community health assessments and improvement plans. So we're in year three and implementation. And so, um, Ultimately, all this information does feed in the state health improvement plan. And so we've been able to look at that process and work internally to support health councils. Uh, my role has been to actually look at the culturally appropriate processes. Um, fun fact, I'm actually the first tribal liaison for the New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils. So there's been a lot of foundational building here. And I don't think that the support that tribal health councils have not had, you know, since since the existence of them in 2007. So um, it was really great for me to play in the role of advocating, looking at different processes and approaches for health councils, tribal health councils specifically, um, and also looking at you know, the involvement of tribal leadership around a lot of this work that's happening. And so advocating in those spaces, um, you know, specific, specifically for some of the challenges and barriers that tribal communities face specifically. I can tell you now that we had so much issue accessing um, accurate data for the vaccine equity of year one. Uh, we did have issues in year two, just a bit accessing data again for community health assessments and community health improvement plans. And so we've been able to, you know, we were able to connect with the uh, Department of Health Office of Tribal Liaison for a lot of that support. And also Aztec, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but that's the Albuquerque area Southwest Tribal Epicenter. So that providing so much support for to us around that area. Um, and just ongoing communication, but this is just a high level overview of some of the things that we do to support health councils. All right, I'm doing so much talking, but we wanna engage you all again. Um, how many of you attend your local health councils um, on a monthly basis? So maybe you have, you haven't, or maybe after today you wanna to attend a health council meeting. So go ahead and feel free to select a question, uh, an answer here, not a question. <laughs> Okay, so we got 57 who attend, 32 who don't, 32% who don't attend, and 11%. So that's amazing. We'll probably get an increase in membership here, um, whether you're community members or partners statewide. Um, and if you haven't, I also encourage you to try and attend a local health council monthly meeting. Um, at the end of my section here, I'll show you where you can find that information. Um, you know, to attend. So thank you all for answering that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move into um, the community health assessment and community health improvement plan section here. I know I've referenced it just a bit, um, but what, uh, you know, with the CDC grant, as mentioned, we were able to um, you know, do a 24 month process around the assessments and improvement plans. I also just want to note too that um, before we move on, the CDC Kellogg grant actually ended in um, May 31st. So that means this grant, um, health councils no longer do not have. But it's it's great in a way that since the funding ended, we were able to get the one-time appropriation to continue a lot of this work. So. Um, in the past 24 months, two years, we were able to engage with our county and tribal health councils, one, to do assessments as, as noted, um, and then two, to do improvement plans. So they were able to develop goals, strategies, 
um, identify who their partners would be, um, you know, depending on their health priority and metrics and outcomes. And so that was all part of the planning process. Um, some county and tribal health councils did not end their planning process until early this year, which is totally fine. I think it was great in the flexibility and being able to meet communities, you know, where they are and, you know, depending on capacity or internal procedures, um, you know, depending on how the health council function. So some of the planning did not end until this early this year. Um, a lot of implementation did begin um, you know, this year as well. So there was a mix of health councils who um, got a chance to implement some who did a lot of focus on planning and collaboration. And so I think it's important to note that as they went through this process, was thinking about who who needs to be at the table, who's not at the table, um, and who can help us get this work done, but also has similar, um, you know, similar priority areas or maybe could support us in, in, in ways that we need support right now, that there's a gap in this partnership that we need. Um, and throughout this process as well, those that have been able to implement their community health improvement plan is working with DOH to evaluate the data. And so this is really key here, um, especially for the interim session and the legislative session is to continue to monitor our uh, the community health improvement plans. Um, health councils have been reporting on a quarterly basis. So we get to see some of their successes, some of their metrics, um, some of their goals that have been completed or in process or not yet started. And so to see this process here for the past two years has been great. Um, but with the one-time appropriation, all of this process will continue, um, the implementation and the evaluation. So continuation of, of this work will happen for sure. Um, the next slide here, we will just get into data points. And you may be familiar with this. Some of the data has been updated to reflect the latest um, community health improvement plans. And so um, what we're seeing here is that statewide, this is both county and tribal, um, behavioral health is the number one priority. I think as we all know, it's we're also seeing that in other assessments being done at state agency levels, but um, health councils have, have also identified this um, through community feedback um, input, you know, from community members. And so a lot of this is community driven, this information. I also want to preface that when we say behavioral health, it is a combination of substance misuse and mental health. So 55% of our health councils statewide um, have identified behavioral health as their priority. And then second to that, we are seeing um, affordable housing um, at 11%. And you'll see here diabetes prevention and elder and aging care, um, you know, coming at a tie here at the third here. But you'll see other um, priorities around nutrition and healthy foods and access to health care um, and uh, violence prevention at 2.8%. And so um, high level overview, um, but just to give some examples of behavioral, some of the behavioral health priorities, um, you know, some are working on referral systems. So looking at that continuum of care, um, how do they, how, how do health councils support, you know, a referral system, like someone's been referred and we wanna be sure that they get the care that they need and it doesn't just stop there. So continuing that, um, you know, follow up through a referral system that health councils are either engaged in. Um, there are some tribal health councils who are developing referral systems um, within their tribal communities, which is amazing. Um, looking at access to behavioral health treat treatment through community events. Some are sharing behavioral health resources. Some are getting their behavioral health resources in the local communities. Um, and then there's also some focus um, specifically around behavioral health around policy. So identifying those issues, highlighting behavioral health uh, as it relates to housing and transportation, and then looking at solutions. You know, what can they recommend to the local jurisdiction around some of these issues? Um, and also increasing civic engagement. That's also been something that's also, um, you know, been noted on community health improvement plans is is how do we get the, 
the community involved and how do we get them out to vote and how do how do we educate them that voting and health you know relate to one another um another is reducing stigma um, I think I noted cultural healing events in tribal communities, um, specifically around substance misuse and um, mental health. And so those are some examples, 988, um, doing suicide training for families and community on distribution of Narcan. Um, so those are just some examples of the priorities and goals that have been outlined. And the next slide here, we are just gonna touch on the regions. Uh, it's awesome that we were able to break this down. And so if you get a chance, look at the bottom here. There are Pueblos outlines and there are counties outlined. So if you find your local community, you know, this is the region that they fall under. Um, could you go back just one bit? Um, but tribal health councils, you'll see behavioral health is the number one focus. In our metro region with Bernalillo, Sandoval, Torrance and Valencia, also with Tohajale, Cochiti, Pueblo, and Santa Domingo Pueblo, behavioral health is number one again. Um, you do see some focus on equally elder and aging care, healthy foods, and diabetes prevention in our metro region. Um, on the next slide, we also break down the Northwest region and the Northeast region. And you'll see in the Northwest, there is a little bit of a shift in priorities. There's focus on healthcare services. And so specifically in our Northwest, there seems to be a lot of focus around transportation, um, working with local IHS 638 clinics. Um, there, um, and also in addition to that, you know, how do um, community members in the Northwest access uh, resources? Um, healthcare resources and services. So that seems to be a, an, a, a priority identified in the Northwest there. Um, equally, behavioral health, affordable housing, and elder and aging care as well. In the Northeast, uh, number one is behavioral health. And so um, second to that is affordable housing and diabetes prevention. Again, you'll see that. And um, access to healthcare. So that also includes transportation. And so you'll see, again, behavioral health being a very common theme. In the Southwest, uh, no surprise here in the Southeast, behavioral health does take number one again. So um, Southwest, we've got behavioral health, elder and aging care and healthy foods, you know, coming second to that. In the Southeast, we've got violence prevention and healthy foods. And so these are very high level examples, but I would also encourage you all to reach out to your county health councils, um, you know, learn about their priorities and maybe there's ways to partner with them or to engage in some other activities as they um, address some of these health priorities listed here by region. And um, the next slide here, I gave some context to priorities, but as of June, we got to also break down what are those strategies? And so um, you'll see in both the county county community health improvement plans and tribal co community health improvement plans, there's been a lot of focus on information and education. And so this means getting information out or maybe training communities. Um, some examples of this are doing some resource directories, um, doing uh, behavioral health trainings like QPR, mental health first aid, um, and then providing information about managing or preventing um, chronic disease diseases. And some of those tactics around um, information dissemination, uh, social media, doing community events. Um, so that, that seems to be taking um, a lot of, uh, those are a lot of the actions here um, health councils have been doing. Um, you will see in the county side access and services. So this this could just refer back to referrals um, or linkages as services. And so um, there has also um, been a lot of a focus on that here. Um, not so much in tribal communities, you'll see it's not as high. Um, data collection and analysis, that has been actually more prevalent in our tribal communities. I think I noted there was challenges with getting up-to-date and accurate data for some of the work and the action planning that they've been doing. And so because of that, 
they a lot of our tribal health councils had to engage in comprehensive community health assessments. So they had to actually start from scratch and get their own primary data um, for a lot of this work that we've done for the past two years. Um, as far as built environments, um, seems to be also more prevalent in tribal communities with walking trails and other efforts like bike paths. Um, partnership and engagement is a given in both. And um, yeah, just a very high level overview of some of the different strategies um, from our county, county health councils and also our tribal communities. Um, and then last slide, I'm just gonna hit on uh, one more data point here and some of the efforts around climate change health impacts is that we have five health councils who are involved in this work here. Um, specifically, I know with the fires here on Rio Doso is, is, you know, looking at drought, but also our li lived environments. And so this grant that some of our health councils are currently involved in right now is looking at how do, how can they respond to health threats um, due to specifically drought and how do they study drought related policies? And so again, building their capacity to assess policies and practices, and then how do they engage community around some of these efforts, specifically priorities outlined um, under drought? And then how can they um, utilize data to inform a lot of their, their processes and planning? And so um, this is a first, it's like a three-year grant, but what's been identified so far in the first year um, from our health councils who are involved with this grant is that um, they their top priority in the local communities have been public water systems. And so, um, you know, specifically looking at drinking water violations and how do they notify the community that their their drinking water has been contaminated. Um, and in addition to that, some other priorities have been climate change education for the general community. And then it's really awesome that they've been able to develop some children's material. So like a coloring book, um, educating them about climate change. Um, and then what are some issues to drinking water, but specifically um, noting it as a human, the access, the lack of access to water as a human right. Um, and as a public health issue in New Mexico, and um, in addition to that, some have been developing greenhouse gardens for their seniors and um, installing solar pumps to provide water for the livestock and wildlife. And so it comes full circle. I think noted Dr. Dr. Doreen Bird this morning said that not just the humans here on earth, but thinking about wildlife and the animals and the plants. And so when we think about water, um, you know, water affects us all and it's really amazing to see that there's been a lot of focus for health councils, health councils as well on this priority issue here. And I'm going to end my section with a poll. Um, how would you like to be involved with your health council? So feel free to choose as many as you like. And this just gives us a sense, you know, um, where there are opportunities for growth and um, if you'd like to go to a monthly meeting, an action team, maybe attend health events that health councils are hosting, um, or subscribe to a newsletter. And then there is an option here for other ways. Um, if you'd like to post in chat or Q&A here, um, go ahead and list your other ways you'd like to be involved. Nice. So if you can all see here, attend monthly meetings seems to be the number one choice here and attend health events. Um, third is join an action team. And so again, I highly encourage um, all of you to reach out to your local health council. And there is a, a link here. So the Alliance has been able to put up put together web pages um, of every county and tribal health council. What you'll get on this web page is the mission and values of each health council, their chip priority, um, their fact sheet, and then how can you can connect with their health council coordinator. So this is just to begin relationship building or maybe ask, well, can I come to your next monthly meeting? I'd love to join. And so just to um, just a little side note too, this may look a little bit different for tribal health councils, 
A lot of our tribal health councils are, are essentially closed councils. And so, you know, just being respectful and reaching out and asking, um, what is the process to join or can I present? Um, or is there an opportunity to be part of your health council, tribal health council? And very quickly, q and I'm just gonna open here. I see Chris's question about a strategy aimed at attitudes. And so I think this one specifically relates to stigma and how we can change the perception of um, community members. And so Chris's question was, what would be an example of a strategy aimed at attitudes that you had listed? And so, um, for example, there are some communities focusing on stigma related to behavioral health. And so, you know, getting an understanding of the perceptions in the community, hearing from those maybe who have um, who have gone through behavioral health treatment and, you know, giving them, a, you know, a side of their story, but also being open, you know, to the different perceptions and that, you know, behavioral health is not just something that is your fault. You know, it's something that it shouldn't be looked down or frowned upon. And this is on both the county and tribal level that we've been seeing in some of these health improvement plans is how do we reduce the stigma around that um, and promote like more self-healing and self-love when it comes to behavioral health. And so that's a strategy um, I've seen listed in some of these health improvement plans. Well, I've done a lot of talking. I'm a little winded. <laughs> And so I'm going to go ahead and stop here with my section and um, pass it to Val to do her introduction for Representative Small. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you so much for the very engaging and thorough presentation about the vital work of health councils. And so everyone, uh, please join me in welcoming Representative Small, Chair of House Appropriations and Finance and Vice Chair of the Legislative Finance Committee, and uh, who was very instrumental in securing, oh, I need to, oh, hold on one second. I need to, later. Um, who was very, very instrumental in securing funds for health councils this year. Thank you, Representative Small. Um, he's also deeply dedicated to improving quality of life for New Mexicans and making strides in healthcare policy, education, public safety, and water and natural resources. Clearly, we are deeply aligned with you, Representative Small. Welcome so to, to uh, the Legislative and Health Council Summit. Thank you. Uh, Valeria and everyone, uh, it is just such a treat to be here with you today. Um, thanks so much for, for making it possible. And I am so excited to uh, hear some of the great work, particularly with our tribal health councils, uh, and to get to share some thoughts with everybody about some of the work that we did the great legislative leaders all across uh, who really helped to make this year possible uh, and to make our, our new investment sort of first time ever state investment, at least during the time that I've been in the legislature. Uh, and to get to talk um, a little bit about other budget highlights and then really uh, think about how we look ahead. Because what we hear and just hearing some of uh, the sharing earlier there are so many common priorities, uh, even as we have so many different, diverse, and incredible communities. Our priorities are oftentimes quite similar. The challenges we face uh, are quite similar, even if it might represent in a different way in a different part of the state and a different community. So um, really excited to share a little bit about the budget, uh, celebrate some of the folks who worked so hard to make this happen, none uh, more than Valeria and everybody with health councils, um, and then to talk about the future. Uh, and it goes without saying, I do want to say it though, um, the most important thing for me during the session after and moving forward is learning from each one of you all, uh, finding ways, you know, we've talked about uh, really uh, spending time with our health councils, learning what you all do in different parts of the state, uh, and then being able to bring that knowledge into the session. Um, you know, so as we dive in on the budget, first, does that sound all right to everybody? 
Excellent. Uh, so as you know, first, um, looking a little bit at the budget overall, where I get the privilege of chairing the House Appropriations and Finance Committee, you know, our uh, top um, responsibility and um, really the incredible opportunity and our constitutional responsibility is developing our state's budget for the coming fiscal year. As everybody knows, you know, our budget at the end of the day, it's one of the most important things. And that's from your household all the way up to the state. Uh, and it's really also a moral document. It helps represent what, who we value, how we prioritize that, and of course, how we uh, invest in, um, in those values. And really, that's all of you here uh, today. The, um, this year's state budget, you know, it was our largest uh, budget in the state's history, $10.2 billion dollars. Um, and when we look at federal funds, um, the our investment in health care, particularly through Medicaid, is the single largest investment that we make as a state. With state general funds, of course, education uh, is the top, followed by health care. Um, first, you know, we're going to talk a lot about our investments, about spending, uh, and appropriately so. But I also want to share with everybody that we have really maintained very strong savings. We maintain robust reserves. Um, we've actually created new funds that save for the future so that uh, as we elevate our levels of spending, we're able to support those levels even in a changing world. Um, this is something I'm sure all of you uh, who have sort of weathered ups and downs in budget cycles who have fought so hard to make new investments in our health councils. Uh, I want to really share that as we make those new investments, we're very much dedicated to continuing to be able to maintain that level. And in fact, actually do sort of modest increases annually uh, in every place that we can. This year, uh, some of the most important investments that we made, of course, Always within education, we saw uh, raises for our educators and other state employees, continuing to make good on the promise of New Mexico's commitment to uh, early childhood and pre-K education uh, with investments there that also include uh, child care. And then making uh, higher education debt-free for hardworking New Mexicans. So whether it's a two-year degree, a four-year degree, or a workplace certificate, uh, anywhere from trucking uh, and welding to uh, say things like with early childhood education, to be able to fund that education for New Mexicans because we know that folks want to work hard to get ahead. This is an area I would highlight, particularly in some of our uh, medical loan repayment areas that uh, holds a lot of promise as we expand uh, and improve our healthcare delivery system. Uh, it is deeply important to continue to uh, prioritize the safety of our communities today and in the long run. So we made sure our law enforcement officers have the tools and the resources they need to keep us safe, continuing to invest in recruitment and retention uh, for our law enforcement officers, and then doing the things like investing in our court system and our public defenders so that the entire apparatus of the justice system and the public safety system receives the funding that it needs in order to uh, help keep our communities safe. We know also that tackling root causes of crime by investing in housing, by far the largest investments in housing in our state's history happened in this past session, uh, well over $250 million, which is super exciting. Um, in new investments in behavioral health and in poverty re reduction. Some that haven't got perhaps quite as much um, uh, notice, but are super important, really developing our workforce. We set aside, uh, the, again, the largest amount ever for apprenticeships and workforce training. That, that's to make sure we have skilled workers ready to tackle 21st century challenges. And then New Mexicans can have good paying, well paying jobs to support their families. 
this is another area within the workforce uh, and apprenticeship area that I would highlight as perhaps an opportunity as we move forward with our health council work um, to bring new resources into our communities uh, to upskill and invest in our healthcare workforce specifically. Uh, and also as a tool for all of you as you're out in your communities um, to sort of offer new opportunities and new hope for folks. Uh, and of course, you know, at the fundamental level, we're growing and diversifying our economy, um, including funding for new industries, core funding uh, like through LIDA and also infrastructure to make sure that we can during this time of real uh, uh, opportunity, a sort of a, a re-emergence uh, through President Biden's work with and our congressional delegation with manufacturing, um, that we are able to land some of those big things also. And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, and for sure most importantly today, we're working to make sure that the healthcare uh, New Mexicans need and deserve is available to all New Mexicans. One of the big places we did that, shoring up the healthcare affordability fund. So everyone has access to affordable health insurance plans. Right now, this is uh, helping tens of thousands of New Mexicans access low cost um, and uh, affordable and um, uh, effective uh, insurance options. The new investments for the healthcare affordability fund that will rededicate uh, revenue in perpetuity to that fund, I think are gonna really magnify and open up our efforts to do work um, for New Mexicans across the state, no matter who they are, no matter where they live. Um, and finally, uh, you know, for the first time uh, ever in our state budget using state funds, uh, funding our county and tribal health councils. Uh, I can't tell you what a uh, thrill and what a proud moment it was to be able to deliver on this critical need. Uh, and with that, I really want to thank so many of my colleagues. You know, Representative Anthony Allison has been a tireless voice uh, and somebody who has worked tremendously hard to educate all of us, to share how important health councils are, to really go back and during some of the toughest times during COVID, remind us how important health councils were then and to make the case moving forward. Uh, ranking member and representative Gail Armstrong, uh, additionally, along with Chair Derek Lente, uh, deserve enormous credit in that space also representing different parts of the state, oftentimes very rural parts of the state. Um, and their voices, you know, in past years, uh, you know, we, we learned, but we weren't able to deliver. This year, we were able to take that uh, knowledge and you all's incredible work and deliver. Uh, I also, I don't know all the legislators who are, are on, but I wanna give a special thanks to Chair uh, Liz Thompson, uh, Representative Wanda Johnson, Representative Tara Lujan, Representative Jack Chatfield, and uh, Senator Liz Stefanics, um, in addition to other folks. Uh, it's a, again, a diverse group, uh, a bipartisan group, and that is so important uh, for us to get the funding that we did. Of course, they and you all, particularly with Valeria really leading the charge, uh, stepped up and advocated for New Mexico's 43 health councils, so that these you know, three decade long institutions can continue your work of serving our communities. Uh, one of the big focuses, of course, for this, for as a state with the over $12 billion, when you sort of add up all the healthcare investments, including federal funds, uh, is to ensure that um, this year's investments can uh, maintain, sure that our councils can maintain your staffing focus on key priorities, which of course are access to primary care and, and behavioral health care. Just heard that in the previous uh, sharing of information. We know it's critical. We're heading towards uh, discussing that again later uh, in July. Um, and we've really learned a lot. And I think there's so much opportunity for our health councils to connect the dots, to make sure that the new and really large amounts of money we're setting aside for these key priorities to 
help guide us on how that money uh, meets and serves people all across New Mexico. Because sometimes it can be uh, tricky to go from that big investment uh, in a budget to the benefits that need to accrue uh, all across our state, whether that's in Southern Doniana County, Northern San Juan County, or anywhere in between. Um, I, again, I'm just very proud that we took the step, even as there were quite, you know, we have uh, with our Department of Health, we have good, strong working relationships. We had to sort of break new ground and say, um, there is a strong history with health councils, and we're open to creating a new future to help uh, with Department of Health. Share your priorities, share your areas of focus, share what you need to invite the same thing from our health councils and to say, we're going to set aside the funding that's necessary for both, but that we need to be working together. And that really reminds us our work is not over. Um as I've learned from speaking with you all, many of you all in this room, uh, part, again, uh, visiting with Valeria recently, um, we need recurring support for our health councils. The best way to do that is to deliver uh, results that span from increased health outcomes and positive health count outcomes for New Mexicans all across our state to stronger structures and sort of uh, regular working relationships between the Department of Health. Frankly, our MCOs, our Medicaid, um, uh, our managed care organizations who administer the Medicaid budgets, and you all who are there on the front lines in our health councils. The more that we're working together, the easier it will be to uh, invest more to make uh, one-time dollars recurring and to right-size these investments. And that's setting up our programs for success in the years to come. Uh, and I want to make sure and say, you know, potentially even expanding those investments once uh, we're able to uh, sort of show the results, sort of lay out a roadmap that says part of our health council, perhaps this could be an example, we're regularly meeting with um, our uh, community members, uh, regardless of who they are, regardless of where they come from, regardless of, of their uh, language, for example, and also our MCOs to make sure that for the folks and the funding that's flowing through the MCOs that we're targeting that, that we're making sure that it reaches the folks in uh, the most need and sometimes who have the most challenge accessing these important healthcare opportunities. Opportunities. So those that potential expansion of investment is so tied to the expansion of services and successfully serving our communities in need. This is exactly where we need your help. You know, you, making your voices heard. Uh, all of you uh, who are in this virtual room, please continue standing up and speaking up. Uh, I can't tell you how impactful the regular. Uh, strong, respectful communication is. I want to very much encourage you all um, to uh, stay connected, to, to share with your legislators, to share with local elected officials, uh, to work with myself, uh, our incredible vice chair, Meredith Dixon, uh, our budget director, Amanda Dick Petty, the speaker's office, to make sure that we're, um, again, continually showing how your work helps all New Mexicans. Um, that's really saying we don't have all the solutions. We certainly have the tools, and particularly right now uh, when we have these strong budget resources, the opportunity. Um, but hearing from you all is just so essential to making this uh, work better. That's one of the reasons why in my two years as HAFC chair, I've worked to make our budget process more open and transparent, uh, having public comment on all agency budgets, inviting new opportunities and always looking for new opportunities to hear from New Mexicans. Uh, I fully believe that by working together, we can make our health councils um, uh, even more effective to make sure you all are getting the support you need to function effectively. 
and to work with you all to improve health outcomes all across New Mexico, because that is what it is all about, improving the health and well-being of New Mexicans for generations to come. So I just want to say a very big thank you for having me today. It's a just a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, look forward to hearing more as we go through today's summit. I'm really looking forward to visiting local councils, learning firsthand, finding new ways to bring in the information that you all see day in, day out within your community, and taking this huge step that we have never done before, the $3 million from our general fund to support New Mexico Health Councils, to look at this as a first step uh, along a journey that will have benefits, lasting benefits for New Mexicans for generations to come. Uh, again, just thank you, Valeria. Thank you so much to you and to your team and to all who are serving in our health councils. And I, uh, again, just wanted to say, um, let's let's keep working together. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. And um, I am excited to be uh, the best partner that we can be on the House Appropriations Committee and from the House of Representatives. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Representative Small. Yes, we are stronger together. That's like our daily mantra and way of being at NMHC and with County and Tribal Health Councils. And we're so deeply grateful to you for your leadership and commitment, not only to improving health and well-being in New Mexico, but advancing health equity in New Mexico and for New Mexicans and for being a champion for New Mexico's County and Tribal Health Councils. We are truly thrilled to be in partnership with you. So we're your ally, we're your partner, we're in this together, all 46 plus plus folks that are here in this room and many more. And um, yeah, looking forward to our next convening. Thank you so much, Representative Small. Thank you all. I'm gonna go off camera, but I'll stay on. Thank you. All right, my dear friends, um, the next segment of our agenda here, speaking of we're stronger together right? Collaboration counts, my friends. Um, and just to be cognizant of the time, because I know um, um, everyone is busy, but we're grateful that you're here. I am going to touch on things on a very high uh, level. In this next slide, it really speaks to the strength, uh, one of the many strengths of county and tribal health councils with regards to their collaboration efforts. And what you're looking at is a dis distillation of a 15 page overview report, high level of all the ways in which health councils are collaborating at the local uh, and systems level and statewide level. And this was curated by our dear friend, Emily McRae at the Public Health Institute. Thank you so much for curating this dynamic visual aid. And so here we have the New Mexico map, of course, the 33 counties. We have our uh, the depiction there with the uh, blue dots um, uh, depicts where the current uh, 10 tribal health councils are located, predominantly Pueblo and Cañocito Band of Navajos. And this, um, if we scroll over tribal health council partnerships, you'll see quite the robust list across tribal nation partners, state agencies, local partners. Um, so in the state agency world, of course, DOH, Human Services Department, uh, Indian Affairs, CYFD, the New Health Authority, New Healthcare Authority, and so forth. So we'll share this with you. We'll also share the 15-page the overview. So not only are you going to be able to learn about uh, how incredibly collaborative uh, the work of health councils are at the local and systems level, but perhaps all the ways in which you can um, explore collaborations um, with your local health council. Um, and next, we want to center our community voices. So we'll be sharing a brief video here. Our Rio Rima Community Health Council means a great deal to me because it is an opportunity for us to collaborate, come together, work on the so social determinants of health in our community. Um, together because a lot of these uh, social problems and social ills that we have are complex and they're tough to solve. Not one organization or agency can solve them. We gotta solve them together. So it's an opportunity for us to come together, uh, leverage our resources, 
and try to make an impact the best we know how. Okay, my dear friends, bear with us. We've got a little delay here with Wi-Fi. It could be one of our internet <laughs> connections. Um, so uh, Sam, if you would just stop the video for a second or two and let it um, catch up to itself. And let's make sure that um, the volume is as um, audible enough for folks to hear. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. And it sounds like the audio is still off. So um, just know that we will be sharing these videos. So let's see what happens in the next segment. Okay, I think there are some technical difficulties with this one, but we're gonna move forward a little bit here with this video. Maybe others are not having the same issue. We'll see. As dedicated as, as I strive to be to provide for this Health councils are very important to me and the work that I do. At my center, we strive to include medically underserved and diverse populations in health research. Health councils allow me to meet with community members, network, create meaningful engagement, and build trust with individuals in efforts to increase New Mexican representation in health research. The data that comes out of research informs our policies, education, medical practices, and everyday lives. So it's really important that New Mexican voices are included and health councils are the conduit to make this happen. I'm so grateful for health councils. I would not be able to do my work without them. I am so sorry. There seems to be some audio issues. Um, Thank you, Sam. I know you're doing your very, very best. And I know everyone's got various um, bandwidth connection with Wi-Fi. So it might, the audio may be coming across for some, but not for all. Um, so just rest assured that we'll be sharing these videos. Let's let's see. Um, I guess we can continue to the next segment. Apologies. Um, and so we'll skip this one, Sam, given that folks were not able to to hear the video. Um, but we'll share it with you, my friends, in a separate email. Um, then the slides so that you you know, can play record and do your thing. Um, so next, we want to talk about community and legislative priority alignment. And I just want to say that a day doesn't go by that I just feel so deeply humbled by the dedication of health councils um, and their key partners working on improving health conditions. Um, and this is another very dynamic slide uh, created by the Public Health Institute. And we're, what we're looking at here, my friends, is five out of the 10 government governor's priorities. 
Okay. Health Council's body of work is and priorities, as you saw earlier in Geraldine's presentation, are deeply aligned with all 10. We wanted to highlight these five, behavioral health being the most pressing red alert priority in and for New Mexico. Um, so if we scroll over behavioral health, uh, my friend Sam here is going to do so. When we think of health in general, right, health um, is at the intersection of everything. Every single health prior, every single priority out there, as Representative Small noted, as the legislators' priorities here, if we don't have a healthy population, we cannot achieve all these very aspirational uh, goals that we have as a state, right? So the most pressing priority is investing in health. The most important investment that we can make as a state is investing in all those mechanisms that are working together to improve the health and well-being of our communities. And so when we look at behavioral health, you can see on the right is intersectional, right? Because health is not compartmentalized. Everything is intersectional with everything else. So when we think of behavioral health, there's an intersection with alcohol and substance uh, use disorder. There's an intersection with various forms of violence, multitude of intersections, suicide, um, so on and so forth. And as we hover over behavioral health, you look to the left, the little bubbles, these are metrics uh, year to date of some of the, of the work the health councils are driving at the local and systems level. So you look at the fact that they have provided over 1,000 Narcan trainings, uh, 1,084 folks trained in Narcan. And Narcan, as you know, prevents overdose. So health councils are literally equipping people to make sure that we can prevent overdoses and save lives, right? They've also distributed over 200 timed pill boxes. We know that children sometimes can get into these pills and or other people and they can cause a lot of health issues and hazards and risks and potentially death. So these time pill boxes are also essential for our elderly population. Then we look at over 200 fentanyl test kits distributed, right? And again, um, this is incredibly helpful as a preventive measure. Um, over 1,100 trained in mental health first aid once again, behavioral mental health being the most, one of the most pressing priorities in New Mexico. Over 4,500 Narcan kits distributed and over 1,300 medication log boxes. So I wanna put this into context, my friends. Imagine a New Mexico where county and tribal health councils were resourced, right? Leveraged for success in service of community members, we could achieve so much more. Here's what health councils have achieved thus far. And there's more data points that we could share with you, but of course we would need an entire week to really break it down. Um, so if we cross, if, if we hover over firearms and safety, there on the right, we see the highlighted governor priorities and on the left, some of the metrics of health councils distributing over 250 emergency kits and over almost 5,000 gun locks preventing gun violence and potential deaths related to, to guns. And then if we hover over vaccinations, we have uh, distribution of uh, COVID um, test uh, kits over almost 4,000 COVID. Yes, we are in an endemic phase, but our tribal communities and other community members are being affected by COVID to this date still. Uh, over one, 41 vaccinations and 18 COVID-related events this year alone. Community outreach is at the center, at the heart of the work of health councils to Representative Small uh, commenting. Uh, health councils are the anchor, the community-based health hubs where community members convene, where they are informed, where they are connected to resources, where they can also inform where funding can be allocated. Thank you for noting that, Representative Small. So here in community outreach, we have so far over 293 community events held, health fairs, prevention, intervention efforts, distribution of various uh, preventive measures, 146 trainings around health prevention, uh, over 80,000 community members reached through efforts of health councils. 
Um, so for the for the purpose of time here, we're going to move over to the next slide. Given that behavioral health is our most uh, our, our most pressing priority. And so this um, this slide deck uh, was put together is put together by uh, our friend uh, at Public Health Institute, of course, and is uh, the Healthy People by uh, forty uh, by twenty thirty uh, from the U.S. Department of uh, Health and Human Services. So this is another depiction of how intersectional behavioral health is to various other. Uh, health indicators. And if we hover over drug and alcohol use disorders, which is obviously, as we just shared with you, something that we noted health councils are driving, addressing, improving these uh, conditions. Here you see other related fa factors to drug and alcohol use disorder, right? Um, you know, sober driving, overdose prevention, youth abstaining from drug and alcohol use, uh, prevention of screening and treatments for hepatitis C is another one as a result of uh, drug and alcohol use. This is a highly interactive uh, uh, flower related to behavioral health and how it intersects. So we'll share that with you. Um, and what I want to now move on to, my dear friends, is uh, centering the voices uh, in the leadership of county and tribal health councils so we're going to hear from five of county and tribal health councils sharing about their vital and instrumental work in service of communities across the state. So let me first welcome Dr. John Andasola, who's the director of Southern New Mexico Family Medical Residency Program, Building Our Workforce, and the director of the Doña Ana Wellness Institute. Welcome, Dr. John uh, Andasola. Appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here and excited to share a little bit about the Doniana Wellness Institute and who we are and and what we've done over the years. Um, Valeria already said that um, I'm Dr. John Andazol. I'm a family physician and I'm a faculty member with the Southern New Mexico Family Medicine Residency Program. But I think today um, we're talking about um, my involvement with the um, Doña Ana's um, Health Council. So I wanna tell you a little bit about us. We're, we call ourselves the Doña Ana, Doña Ana Wellness Institute. We were founded in 2014 and I'm the founding president at that time. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how that came about. So um, I was born and raised in Las Cruces. I went to New Mexico State University, went to UNM for medical school um, and then spent 12 years um, out of the state. Um, I come back to Las Cruces. Um, my goal has always been to serve the community. And I came back to Las Cruces and started teaching in the residency program. Um, and then I would go to the mall and um, one of the federally qualified health centers, La Clinica de Familia, would be hosting a, a health fair there, um, a health fair regarding diabetes. And then I would go down to um, downtown Las Cruces to our farmer's market and there would be another health fair um, hosted by um, Ben Archer. And then I went to the university and the... Um, um, nursing students are hosting another health fair um, on diabetes. And all three of these organizations um, are doing a great job and teaching and reaching out to the community and talking about our, our the health of our community re as related to diabetes, but no one knew what the other person was doing. And so what, what I did is I asked, hey, would you be excited? Would you be happy to join um, a group that brings people together. Would you like to join um, a collaborative that brings um, health stakeholders from our community together to talk about our interactions? And so we can actually collaborate together. So we can um, be good stewards of our limited resources and really have a bigger impact on New Mexico. And it was universal. Everybody said, bring me to the table. Let's talk, let's get together. And since then, the Doña Ana Wellness Institute has been a convener, has been a place where people can come to the table um, and we can welcome um, people to the, to the table who have an vested interest in the health of Southern New Mexico and the health of Doña Ana County specifically. And we thought bigger. Um, we brought hospitals, we brought federally qualified health centers, clinics, physicians, 
when brought New Mexico State University and various colleges from New Mexico State University. But we also brought our judicial system to the table and our public schools to the table and the fire department to the table and other um, community organizations um, to the table because they are all health stakeholders and they all play a major role in the health of our of our of our community. So I want to talk to you about upstream medicine and 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 what that means and what our focus has been. So upstream medicine is is really thinking about the cause of disease. Where where does disease come from? And I'll give you an example. You can you can envision our healthcare system as this raging river of disease. And so all of our patients are in this river and they're they're drowning. And, and they're struggling. They're struggling with their diabetes. They're struggling with their heart disease. They're struggling with obesity. And they're in this river. And the United States has, you know, some of the best swimmers and the divers and great submarines and helicopters and boats, all this technology to pluck these people out of this river and save their lives, to make their lives better. And that's the downstream approach. Um, those those um, divers and the helicopter pilots, you know, those are your cardiologists and your cardiothoracic surgeons. And, and all of that equipment I talked about are your MRI scanners and your, um, um, you know, um, advanced um, medications that we use. But who is thinking about why these people are in the river? Upstream medicine is about walking up that river and saying, why are people jumping in in this river in the first place? And how do we keep them out of the river so we don't have to invest downstream? So we can make sure that the investments make a difference. Um, so a story I tell is um, is my metformin story, and it's a story about a patient with diabetes. So I'm a physician, I'm a family doctor. A patient came, comes to me, and I diagnose them with diabetes. And you know, I feel like I'm a pretty good doctor, so I recommend the correct, the right medication. I give them metformin. Um, I give them information on diet. I give them information on exercise. I give them things to read. I send them to a diabetes educator. And then they come back and see me <clears throat> in, um, um, in about a month or so, and they're not taking their medicine. And they haven't changed their diet, and they're not exercising. And when I was in training, you know, um, 25, 30 years ago, we would say, ah, oh, they're non-compliant, you know, might as well just move on unless they have some skin in the game you're not going to get anywhere but you know i work in an institution that has integrated behavioral health and i have a behavioral health person there at the table and he says to me dr anzola you know taking a medication every day um changing your diet exercising that's behavioral change that requires behavioral modification and you can't just tell somebody to do it you have to you have to work with them. You have to do motivational interviewing. You have to figure out where they are and what their barriers are and how that's addressed. I said, okay, great. Well, let's do that. So uh, I bring in my behaviorists. You know, we work with the patients. We do motivational interviewing. We go upstream. We figure out where those barriers are and we help to address those. So they come back and see me and they're taking their medication every day. Um, and I say, well, how's the exercise going and how's the diet? Um, and they say, well. I really wish I could follow your simple steps. You said, you know, when you get home from work, take a walk around the block. I live in a colonia. I get home, it's dark. Um, there's no sidewalks. There's no street lights. Everybody seems to have a pit bull. I'm, I can't. I can't walk around my block. That's impossible. Um, 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 you tell me to get free ice fruits and vegetables. Well, in my town. There's two stores. They're both convenience stores, and the fresh fruits and vegetables are kind of soggy and brown. I'm not going to get those, and it takes me an hour out of my way to go to the grocery store. So this individual lives in a in a food desert, um, and they don't have a built environment that allows for a healthy lifestyle. And so, as a physician, it's hard for me to to make significant change against that. So I'm looking upstream. If this person lived in a, across the street from a park that had street lights and, and sidewalks and they had a healthy um, grocery store right down the street, it would be much easier for them. And if those foods were subsidized so it was cheaper than the fast food down the street, it would be much easier for them. 
So that's the upstream approach. And that's what we work on and have taught um, and invested in um, with our interventions at and the Doniana Wellness Institute. So over the years since, since the, we've been founded, we've hosted a health in all policies education. And what it was is it's really um, teaching that all policies, whether they're institutional, whether they're city level government, county level government, state government has a health impact. And understanding that health impact um, changes how you address the built environment and what happens. And we've ha held um, conventions that brought together um, city and county um, leadership, um, including business leadership, and talked about the health and all policy strategy and what that does. And we've noted significant changes in the investments um, in our community when we think about health. The other thing that we've done significantly is a structural competency education. And what structural competency is, it's really understanding that upstream approach. It's understanding that um, health comes from the social determinants and it's from your built environment. It's where you live, work and play that makes a difference. Um, what I do as a physician is a tiny fraction of uh, making somebody's health better. It's what's happening in that um, built environment. And so really understanding that plays a big role and understanding that there are six levels of intervention within structural competency, understanding these structures that surround people in their daily lives. And those six levels of intervention are levels we all can take, not just the policymakers, um, but everyone around the table. So the first one is personal um, intervention. What can I do? Am I addressing my biases? Am I thinking about um, the generous assumption? Am I um, um, approaching a person with stigma because they have a substance use disorder or because um, they um, are suffering from homelessness? And what am I doing to address those personal biases? The next one is Interpersonal, how do I interact with individuals? The third level is institutional. What in my clinic, what in my hospital, what in my institution, whatever that is, um, 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 creates barriers um, for people. The next one is community, and that's a big part of the Doniana Wellness Institute. What in a community um, are we doing to address barriers in front of people for uh, obtaining their best health? And then the last ones are policy and research, and really thinking about what policies impact the daily lives of the people in our communities, whether they're policies in our own clinics or whether they're state or city or county level um, um, policies. So what we've done is we have actually created formal education. We've partnered with New Mexico State University and created formal education where you can get online. It's an online education through New Mexico State University. You get a certificate from this and you actually learn about the, the, the um, basic tenets of, of structural competency. So you understand the upstream approach and how to take those impacts. So that's been another very impactful intervention that has been done by the Doniana Wellness Institute. Now, currently with our CHIP focus, we're focusing on um, organizational health literacy, not just the health literacy of the individual, but the bigger organization and how they affect um, the, um, the, the support the individuals in their health literacy. We're obviously, as the rest of the state is, deeply invested in, in, in substance use disorder and have been very um, um, upstream with um, um, Narcan prevention, but we also are talking about the stigma related to um, medications for opiate use disorder and how to get more doctors prescribing appropriate medications and addressing stigma within our within our community, within our clinics, so we can um, treat the population that suffers from this disorder. And then thinking other causes like why. These are these are disorders of disease. These are disparities. What 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 does it say? These are diseases of disparity. So you know people are suffering because there's something in their environment that's that's causing causing that. And then we're currently, um, as was talked about before, 
doing community health assessments and really thinking about what's happening in our communities. And the way we're doing it is we're doing, we've partnered with New Mexico State University and with Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine, and we're doing windshield surveys. And we're going to the communities and each of our um, communities within Doniana County, including all of the colonias, and asking them, where, where, um, where are your needs? Where are your assets? How can we help you build on the assets that you currently have so we can partner and move things forward? So um, that was a brief, um, rapid and succinct uh, um, 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 story of the Doña Ana Wellness Institute, where we are and where we're going. And I have to say a lot of the state um, we've done this um, with no funding for many years, and the funding that we've had over the last several years, especially with the last year, has really um, allowed us to make some big steps in addressing some of the concerns with Doniana County and thinking about those upstream causes. So thank you for your time, um, and I'll turn it back over to Valeria. Thank you, Dr. Andazola, so much uh, for sharing on all the amazing work in Doña Ana County. Um, and now, please uh, join me in welcoming Iris Riano and Anthony Yepa from Santo Domingo Pueblo, Health Council coordinators who are making strides in improving elderly and aging care and so many other conditions uh, in, in public health. Thank you so much for being with us today. Over to you, Iris and Anthony. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I'm Iris Riano. I'm with the Santo Domingo CHR program. Also, we are known under as the HOPA Coalition. The HOPA acronym means um, Healthy Organized Partnership Advisory Committee. So that's what we may have our coalition under. We'll have Anthony introduces. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for giving us the opportunity to express some of the things that the state legislature that funded the tribal and county health council's dollars have provided to the community of Santa Domingo. As you know, we have been uh, just recently uh, become members of the uh, Alliance of Health Councils, and it has given us an opportunity to go ahead and do some of the things that we will be discussing. As Representative Small talked about, it is really uh, impactful to see how the state laws, the state funding, and all of the all of the uh, laws and policies that are developed are impacting our tribal communities. It is important to note that, um, <clears throat> especially with the increase that we are seeking, is that this has been going on in other communities for a long time. But due to the infrastructure in a lot of our tribal communities, the limited infrastructure, we have been able to utilize and are planning on the funding to help us with not only looking at the services in, uh, in Santa Domingo, but also looking at a lot of the upstream issues in health that the doctor just talked about. It was a good segue into our presentation because we are also always at the community level. And by that, I mean the health council members are community members that are part of the, the council that we have. They are not providers, they are not doctors, they are not therapists, but community people who have taken the interest to be part of this council. And what they do is they come and they try to orient themselves to the complex world of healthcare in terms of Medicaid services, state services, uh, federal services, and even local services to see if they could make rhyme and reason, not only on the type of services that is being provided, but also the intended funding and also how it can be beneficial. Now, keep in mind that uh, Santa Domingo is quite conservative. It still has very unique norms, values, a different perception of health, and, and still has a lot of the normal uh, major problems that we see in terms of heart disease, diabetes, uh, things that are more common in the state. So as state members, 
our our HOPA Health Council has been asking a lot of questions, and with that, we sometimes have to explain the uh, <clears throat> all the programs that the state legislature has authorized. For example, the new health authority that is being developed, the HOPA Health Council is now able to ask the questions on how that's going to integrate and work with the existing programs that are being applied in our tribal communities and uh, statewide. How is the new consolidation effort going to be impacting the existing services and who, and how can they voice their issues and concerns? It is important to note that the state legislatures approve these dollars uh, understanding the, and thinking that it's going to be impactful and beneficial to their state residents. But a lot of times we find that the state residents are unaware of the services of the intended legislation and sometimes very difficult to implement those services based upon local infrastructure as described by the doctor. They may not have the providers, they may not have the buildings, they may not have the uh, uh, wherewithal to understand how they're impactful in terms of the legislation that has been provided. I know that the San Domingo Health Council has come up with some plans, community health improvement plans, and we have been asking how that was going to be integrated into the overall state plan. Before this, we never would have been able to have an impact in terms of voicing our concerns with the state health plan, but now we do due to the funding that has been provided. Uh, a lot of the normal questions that come out at the community level uh, coming from uh, all the services that are provided, provided by the state as well as the federal government, we end up asking and working with the partners in terms of uh, asking questions about Medicaid, going to the income support division and handholding some people to make sure that they get enrolled with the Medicaid programs. And now with the new health authority described by uh, Representative uh, Small, that is gonna be a challenge because that money is available to everybody, but how do we access it? How do we communicate the people that are providing and administering that program? So these are very much gaps that have been placed in our local community and now we have an opportunity at least to have somebody on staff to develop the infrastructure, to develop the language, to develop the places as to where to go so that we will be able to work and benefit that will be beneficial to our uh, tribal members. So I think that that is one of the reasons why we also ask a lot of questions being that we knew health council members because some of the intended uh, discussions that we see in the state legislature, uh, being able to go to the state legislature, even bring this to the representatives and senators' attention is also important to us now, because before this, we barely had time to be doing this. But now we have an opportunity to send you emails, to leave you written notes, to be part of the the committee discussions. And as a health council member, now we have that opportunity to do that. But I think the most important thing is that sometimes the legislature <clears throat> does not have the time or maybe even the capacity to look at how impactful their laws, their service, intended services are received in the various rural, tribal, <clears throat> even the urban communities. <clears throat> And I think that the Health Council in Santa Domingo now has community members who can understand what is going on and give us feedback and relay that information up to the DOH or to the Alliance, to whoever the people that are evaluating the services. Because I think that based upon the different norms, the different attitudes that we have at local communities, sometimes we have to work with our own tribal leaders in educating them to own with our own county governments, with our own uh, representatives who work with our communities. And it's difficult sometimes to get that time and maybe that information to them. But now I think we have a segue. We have a method of doing this and we are able to discuss a lot of the uh, upstream issues that uh, the, the doctor was talking about. But for 
us as community-based people living and working, uh, knowing the language in Santa Domingo, knowing the people, knowing the norms, the values and the attitudes, and of course, some of the limitations we have as in, in providing healthcare, we do have now a way to at least start the process of integrating and coordinating all of this with all of the providers as well as the legislatures. So our main point, my point today is really to let you know that your money is gonna be well spent, that at least now you have an opportunity <clears throat> to <clears throat> assure that the health council dollars are really being uh, impacted at the community level and to make sure that we become part of the governor's uh, continuing DOH budget. And I will let Iris talk a little bit more on a few of the local things that we are providing there. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so that was great information that he has given and shared with you. Um, I'm going to be more on the the level of um, dealing with the HOPA coalition members. Um, as in the beginning, you saw the there's three ladies that were um, in the picture and those ladies have been dedicated um, with, with our programs and being part of the coalition. And we hear their voices, we, we get their recommendations because they are the ears, the eyes in our community. We've had, um, we've been trying to recruit male um, members and we have been successful. We have another new male representative coming on board. Um, so with that, when Anthony talks about enrollment of health insurance in our office, we get a lot of um, community members coming to our office asking, like, um, why did they cut me off on uh, Medicaid? Why did they cut me off on SNAP benefits? And just giving that health education for them to understand why the difficult questions, because sometimes they are very personal, difficult questions that they're not able to share um, or not comfortable giving out. But once we sit down and translate for them um, and making sure that they're understanding the application, um, they have a better understanding on why the questions are being asked. Um, so those are some of the things that we deal with. Another thing that we were talking about earlier, because of, and I asked Anthony about like global warming, you know, we, it feels like a lot of the native population don't put their mindset to it. But for example, yesterday we had a very large dust storm between Santo Domingo and San Felipe. And I was just asking him earlier, like, what do we need to do? What, how can we approach our coalition members on how to have a better system to keep our people safe, um, you know, that are traveling through or that are just within our areas? So that's just a new question that I'm going to be asking our coalition members. But going back to the other services that we are providing, we have been doing presentations throughout the state regarding COVID because for one, I'm glad we were able to take some photos and we were documenting on uh, things that we were doing as frontline workers during COVID. So we've been um, talking at several presentations and being guest speakers on those areas because you know we were the frontline workers and just sharing that information back on what we have learned through about our community is that we, we have the resources, we just need to implement them and make sure that we, we are providing the best services for our community members. Um, I'm sorry. But um, those are some of the services that we are providing. We do meet on a regular basis. We, we and um, our IT, our technical assistant people will understand, um, you know, there's days when our village closes and we have a, cal a traditional calendar that we follow. So we, we may schedule um, dates to have our meetings, but something happens that day. So we re have to reschedule, but we try to have our meetings um, on the dates that we have scheduled. If not, we reschedule them throughout the month just to be more active and get the thoughts of what recommendations the coalition members may give us. 
And I think, well, I think that that's our presentation. Uh, we just uh, hope that the legislature, as well as the representatives and senators, all uh, support the health councils because we do now realize that funding the uh, San Domingo Hopa Health Co Coalition not only helps us as uh, council members, but also helps tribal leadership because tribal leadership is inundated with a lot of uh, not only uh, issues, problems, concerns, federally, statewide, locally, and a lot of times they need some uh, technical assistance and maybe some input from our uh, coalition members to provide them some of the information necessary so that they can be able to discuss these in an educated fashion to not only the state, but as well as to federal agencies. And that's where I think uh, uh, having the documentation and the understanding that we are able to achieve through the health council, we can relay this information to our tribal leadership who will then be able to make some major decisions on behalf of their community members. One thing I did forget um, that I do want to make sure that I voice is we do have data that we have collected and just to share those. And I, I've used this um, version of it, like a lot of our council members, or a lot of our health committees, um, community members are visual learners. So in order for us to report the data back, we have to do show them visual visually on where we are at with collecting information and why we are collecting the information. So those are some of the things that I do want to share with you. And with that, that's all we have. Um, thank you for taking the time to give us this time um, to share our uh, services that we provide in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Iris and Anthony. We're so grateful to you, your leadership, your dedication. Um, sorry, Geraldine, were you going to come on? I, I think I may have heard you. Oh, nope. I'm going to go ahead and cue Otero's video next. Thank you. So just want to uh, acknowledge Kayla Blanchard, which is the video uh, Geraldine's going to be playing here momentarily. She's the health council coordinator at the Otero County Community Health uh, Community Health Council, and they're making strides in addressing mental health, substance misuse, and improving population health through their healthy eating and active living program. Over to you, Geraldine. Okay, Val, and just give me a thumbs up if the video is playing. I know we had some technical technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share a little bit about my health council. I'm Kayla Blanchard, the health equity specialist and coordinator for the Otero County Community Health Council. To start this off, I'm going to take you on a journey. The Otero County Community Health Council has been active since 1996. We envision our county to be a place where all people have a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. In order to achieve our vision, we promote programs, practices, and policies that advance health equity. Of course, health equity is going to look different depending on the populations or communities we interact with, so we have devised three different action teams to accomplish our Health Council's priorities. We prioritize reducing substance-related harm, improving outcomes for justice-involved families, civic engagement, and of course, health equity in the varying settings we are fortunate enough to occupy. Before I get into the work we do, I want to share more about our Health Council membership. Our membership consists of diverse individuals ranging from behavioral health professionals, public health professionals, healthcare providers, community-based agencies and nonprofits, to local government officials, military personnel, MCOs, and interested community members. We strive to foster a sense of belonging and unity among our members and county residents. We actively engage with community members, ensuring their voices are heard and their needs are met. Through community outreach events, as well as formal and informal conversations, we strengthen social ties and promote collective well-being. I would be amiss to not mention the leadership of my health council. 
Our Executive Health Council Committee consists of strong, forward-thinking, driven women who are dedicated to incorporating the voices of everyone, specifically the ones that go unheard and overlooked, to achieve optimal community health. We have three elected officers, as well as representation from DOH, Otero County Healthcare Services Department, and our fiscal agent, as well as three contractors. Each individual brings a unique experience and perspective to the table that is essential in guiding our work towards optimal delivery of equity within our capacity. Additionally, our Health Council believes in giving people first and second chances by providing the tools, opportunities, and support to thrive thus leading to strengthening relationships and enhancing the work we do by incorporating those diverse and necessary voices into our work. But that being said, our Health Council demonstrates a strong commitment to improving the lives of our county residents. We assess, promote, and enhance the health and well-being of county residents by encouraging and supporting broad-based community involvement with the help of our partner entity, the Behavioral Health Collaborative, and our three action teams. So our first team is the Healthy Eating Active Living that focuses on nutritional education, access to healthy foods, and increased physical activity. Our next team is Community Awareness, Resiliency, and Engagement, and it is committed to improving the outcomes for children, youth, and families with behavioral health challenges through education, engagement, and outreach. And lastly, our final action team is the Health Equity Action Team that addresses and works towards eliminating health disparities through community organizing and promoting civic engagement and civic health. In addition to the action teams and the general health council membership, we partner with numerous agencies and organizations, including but not limited to 100% Otero, Otero County, Christus Southern New Mexico, local school districts, the mobile crisis response team, Otero Public Health Office, state agencies, behavioral health providers and agencies, and so many community-based organizations. Through mass collaboration, we've conducted or supported several projects, initiatives, and assessments. To name a few, we have created food and community meal resource lists, a community scavenger trail hunt to promote physical activity, a women of color sexual empowerment series to provide culturally relevant and medically accurate sexual health information, kindness week promotion, crisis intervention training, the 2019 County Health Assessment, and so much more. Leveraging on what work is already being done within the Health Council, but also in the community, was a driving point for our development of our Community Health Improvement Plan, or our CHIP. After gathering community input and undergoing data and health priorities prioritization, we settled on focusing on mental health, which includes substance use, crisis response, access to care and suicide prevention, However, with the focus on drivers of health and access issues of housing slash homelessness and transportation, we are prioritizing individuals and families that are dealing with mental health and or substance related crises, people who are unhoused, experience housing insecurity, are in a gap who need support but don't qualify, those who are reintegrating after incarceration, and people with a lack of dedicated transportation or with barriers to access basic needs. In addition to utilizing national data sources for local data, we also use local assessments like the 2019 County Health Assessment and the 100% Otero Survey to inform our health priority selection process. To inform our goal development, we relied on our potential to address racial and other health inequities, our potential for interventions at multiple levels, so individual, organizational, community, and political slash policy levels, as well as the extent to which it aligns with existing priorities slash community buy-in and investment. So again, leveraging on what already exists to further the work and uplift it. We developed four short-term goals and two long-term goals to address our health priority. So far, we have played a key role in five initiatives that have focused on improving our community continuum of care to support people living with mental illness and or substance use disorders. Those initiatives were the Crisis Intervention Training, the Pit Count, 100% Otero Summit, a Community Housing Symposium, and our county's Sequential Intercept Mapping Workshop. So through our role with each initiative, we've assisted to improve communication and collaboration among government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and service providers. We also helped to increase availability of resource listings to the community. 
To strengthen community relationships, increase visibility of services and supports for community members, and enhance communication of those agencies I just mentioned, we participated in eight community outreach events that focused on raising awareness of and increasing access to existing resources since last summer. We also promote those events and resources regularly at monthly meetings, through email correspondence, and on our social media platforms. We've identified a team to develop an issue brief highlighting local housing and transportation needs and potential policy solutions so we can increase awareness of local needs and increase advocacy for housing and transportation policy improvements. So that is one way we intend to address housing and transportation needs on a policy level. Now pivoting back to us crafting this action plan to align with existing priorities, our last short-term goal is to provide nonpartisan civic health training to at least 10 organizations. And I'll talk about our health council's commitment to civic health in just a bit, but our intention with this is to increase voter registration and voter participation, as well as increase the number of organizations participating in the National Nonpartisan Initiative ODR. So to promote civic engagement and civic health, we have conducted trainings at our meetings and other organizations' meetings, including 100% Otero. We presented at the New Mexico Public Health Association, the New Mexico Primary Care Training Consortium, and we've administered a civic health survey to our membership to gather data that will inform our strategies. Additionally, our work has been recognized by the League of Women Voters Southern New Mexico as they presented me with the Making Democracy Work Award, which is truly a testament to our collective work as a health council to ensure that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to exercise their fundamental right to vote. We crafted our long-term goals to build upon the work that we are doing with the short-term goals. So we intend to conduct a housing and transportation equity assessment and share it with community leaders, partners, and decision makers, as well as increase past year civic participation among health council members. So the Otero County Community Health Council does a tremendous amount of work and we take a multifaceted approach to ensuring equity for all communities. Not only are we composed of committed driven individuals and agencies, but we are also forging a path to integrate both civic health into health equity conversations. A few of us participated in a seven-month civic health fellowship with BODIAR, the National Nonpartisan Initiative, that aims to integrate voter registration into the healthcare space. However, as public health professionals, we've adapted those strategies and tools to apply it to both clinical and community settings. Similar to the Health Council vision, we envision our county to be a place where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to participate in the democratic process. With the American Medical Association formally acknowledging voting as a social determinant of health last year, that just reinforces the importance of civic health promotion. 20% of our healthcare experiences are influenced by the policies our elected officials implement. So our health council promotes voter engagement in any way we can. We conduct trainings on the tools and our approach to various agencies like the Otero Public Health Office, the Counseling Center, which is a community mental health facility, the Family Medicine Residency Program, graduate students, community health workers, and at community events, Juneteenth Celebration and Mescalero Health Fair are just two examples. We also presented at the New Mexico Public Health Association through their various events and at the state capitol last year. We recognize that your vote is your voice and your voice is powerful and important in shaping the health of your community because you know your community best. So this was only a snippet of the work the Otero County Community Health Council does, but if you would like to know more, please feel free to contact me, join our membership and attend our meetings. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, for your wonderful video. I know you're not here today, but we're going to go ahead and invite Tana from the Rio Arriba County Health Council. Are you here, Tana? Oh, there she is. Okay. Yeah. Are you able to unmute?
Okay. Give a second for Tana to join. Can you guys hear and see me? We can see you, but can't. Or no, we can hear you, but can't see you. <laughs> oh. Let's see. Hmm. No, nope, but we can hear you, Tana, if you'd like. Okay. Let's go ahead then. <laughs> Sorry, I would crawl under my desk and check my connections, but that might not be a good look. Um, hi, everybody. This has been really great. Um, really happy to be here today to represent the Rio Reba Community Health Council. Um, so much of what everybody said, um, I would also say. So I'm going to jump to what I see as really important things for our legislators and our funders to know about the importance of health councils. Um, a few people have already spoken to to it, um, especially at the at the beginning, I think it was Representative Thompson who spoke about the the structure of the public health department in the state of New Mexico, and that it's a state structure, and that at the county level, health councils are crucial to bring the voice of um, the ground to the state level and 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 that is so so important. So I want to speak to the importance of health councils as not reinventors of wheels that are already churning well or have been churning for a long time, hopefully both. Um, and the importance of not taking hands off the wheel. Um, and that's a long way to say, I wanna speak about healthy and fair collaboration. So good community organizing necessitates knowing what already exists. So health councils are forced to, forced in a good way, are, um, are structured to work very closely with the Department of Health. Um, and not only, Department of Health, but other organizations in, in their local community that are working around social determinants of health, around the provision of healthcare services and everything that surrounds health, transportation, food, housing, lots of stuff that's already come up. Come up. Um, but lofty goals and good intentions do not translate to a successful health council without um, really true collaboration, which is all about relationship. So um, in the 30 years I've been working in community public health, um, nothing will kill a relationship faster than feeling disrespected. And so by using health councils, the Department of Health and larger organizations get a true picture of what's already happening on the ground so that they don't get stuck in that classic mistake of the big entity dropping into a community what they think should be done. Um, and either that being wrong or people are already doing it and it feels disrespectful. So I think that's a, a really crucial um tool that health councils bring is the knowledge of what's already being done. Um, going back to something that Representative Thompson also spoke about are, I think she phrased it, the show horses versus the work horses. And, and often if a large entity comes into a community and drops programming um, with the best of intentions, often that funding or um, workload goes to the show horses because that's who people know. But that's often why programs fail is that you really have to know who the workhorses are. And like she said, those are not the people who, who other people know because they're not on the news and they're not out there. And both are necessary. I, I say that 
undisparagingly because um, I really honor people who are show horses, get out there and do it. And because those of us who are workhorses don't necessarily like that. So both are necessary, but, but work should be expected from the workhorses and you have to know who those people are. And so working locally is so important. Um, the role of a health council is to help coordinate services, to connect community to existing critical resources or to shine a spotlight on gaps in resources, to engage with coordination of services and connect, excuse me, I already said that, and help people, communities, and organizations overcome barriers to accessing healthcare and quality social determinants of health that they need to live healthy, happy lives. Um, so what we found here in Rio Reba County, just as an example around food and housing. Um, first, the example of food. Um, during the COVID pandemic, many, many, many organizations um, started to or beefed up their current services around food distribution. So when the pandemic ended and kids went back to school, there were all these organizations who were giving food away, but there was no coordination in those services. So for example, there can be food distribution on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. But if you happen to be hungry on a Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, you just need to wait until the next food distribution because it wasn't coordinated. So the health council through our food action team was able to help coordinate those services. Like, hey, there's no food distribution on Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. How can we fix this problem? Also around food, what food is be being given out where? And how can we coordinate? How can we get the food distribution out of the hub of Española or Chama and into the more rural areas, which is always a challenge, especially for larger organizations to do. But when when you're working on the ground level, like health councils do, the people who sit on a health council are local. So for example, we're doing a food distribution in the small community of Cordova, um, Saturday, June 29th, and we're doing it in the yard of the mother of a guy who sits on our health council and their family is donating their trailer for us to carry food up there. So that's that's how you get groundwork done. Um, so the importance of not reinventing the wheel, keeping your eye on local ground level grassroots health work, such an important piece of overall health outcomes in the state of New Mexico. And then the last thing I would like to say is um, how important it is to not lose ourselves in collaboration, but insist on strong boundaries between organizations um, in terms of sharing our logos, um, making sure that one organization is not getting all the credit for all the work that everybody is doing. And I feel like a health council can help to mitigate those natural tendencies that humans have towards power, towards money, towards um, notoriety, whatever it is, um, that the health council can really help for smaller voices to help coordinate together with the larger voices. And that's what makes for excellent community health work that we're all so devoted for. So um, I just I just just want to give a shout out to the Alliance for all the technical assistance that they have given around things like that, because often people come to the table being really good at what they're really good at. That might be food distribution, that might be exercise, that might be being a doctor but it's not necessarily how to create a community agreement, right? And so um, the Alliance is so helpful with our, um, helping us with the larger overriding issues that we need to be a healthy um, 
champion for change in our communities. So I think I'm going to stop it there. Um, I didn't talk so much about our particular health council, just overall things I see. Um, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Tana, for the important, vital, and instrumental work you're driving through all your key collaborations and community members uh, around Rio Arriba County. We're so deeply grateful to all of our health councils, county and tribal health councils across New Mexico. And now on to our next segment, my friends, a pathway forward. I want to welcome Sipora Nepesh, who is the executive director of New Mexico Thrives and a strong advocate of county and tribal health councils. Uh, Sipora founded New Mexico Thrives, the role of nonprofits in New Mexico communities. Welcome, Sipora. Thank you for leading us in this space that we're about to step into. Great. Thank you. And I'm excited to continue this conversation and together brainstorm a pathway forward. And I am waiting for the first question to magically appear. Yes. So our dear friend Sam is going to drop the link, my friends. Um, if you turn to your chat, um, you'll find a link to the Jamboard that you are seeing on the screen. And as uh, Sephora facilitates this space, this is where we'll capture your voices, your ideas, your input, your recommendation. Um, yes. So Please use the sticky notes on the left and write down your ideas and put them on the board to answer the question, what does a healthy community look like and feel like? And once you've done that, we will uh, review the suggestions and uh, prioritize them. So the first step is to write down your thoughts, clean air, food, and water. Great. And thank you for, I don't know if it's uh, who is in the background doing technical assistance, but that's very helpful. Leaders lead and use resources for the benefit of the community. Yes, please. Another one about food. Oh, food is a big issue. The community is kind to one another, yes. Dopamine and serotonin providing activities abound. So uh, some of us may need translation on that, but it seems to me that it's activities that make one feel good and also help provide a sense of community. And if I didn't get that quite right, uh, whoever wrote that comment, please add a sticky note to expand what you mean. Safe spaces to move our bodies. Yes, we heard earlier that someone was recommended exercise but didn't feel safe walking around his neighborhood. Equity and inclusion, access to basic needs to survive. Yes. Okay, so many great suggestions. One where people are comfortable interacting with neighbors in person near homes or public areas, and then kids are supervised and have exciting, inspiring things to do. Yes. Neighborhoods in the true sense of the meaning neighborhoods where everybody looks out for the kids and the elderly. New Mexico legislature funding for FY25 for NM health councils and the food initiatives that didn't get the full funding needed to benefit the health and well-being of New Mexicans. So um, 
let me reinterpret that and say that I think what you are asking for is uh, full funding to do the work we need to do to create healthy, vibrant communities. Okay, so here's one about climate change. We have analyzed community health data against weather predictions and each community has received state grants to develop unique ways to protect health from climate events or to prepare for climate events. Reimagine climate change in ways that eliminate health inequities and protect ecosystems. Yes, tree canopy built for pedestrians, not just cars. Lovely plants and native species abound. Okay, so there's lots of ideas up on, on the Jamboard right now, which is wonderful. And the next step is I want you, whoops, we're not going to the next Jamboard yet. Thanks. Um, if you see the pen at the top of the uh, toolbar on the left, click on the pen. And then you can put a heart, a star, a circle over the ideas that you think really stand out and are really important. So is that clear? You click on, there we go. Somebody's got the pen. Yes. Close enough. We are not rating your drawing skills. We just want to see that there are marks, clean air, food, and water. Who doesn't want that, right? Okay, people are able to work collaboratively. People need to feel respected and heard to be able to do that. Adequate healthcare providers, that is a challenge for New Mexico. And if that's a goal, then we need to work back from there. What will it take to get the number of healthcare providers that we need? And the legislature is certainly working on that. We, we have um, uh, student loan forgiveness for those who stay in state and work in the healthcare field. But any additional ideas, I'm sure they would welcome that. A community that fi is financially and economically viable with people getting family support level salaries for work. Yes. So our state legislature has a number of policies that support uh, families with children um, to uh, give them tax breaks to bring them up to a certain level of income. And that's fantastic. We are leading the way on that. And there is more to be done. Okay. Eliminating stigma. Well, it looks like we have a number of votes about um good ideas. And so I would like to suggest that we, <laughs> looks like somebody is circling all of them. Okay. Well, I think it's time we move on to the next Jamboard so that we have an opportunity to answer this question, what change is needed to create healthy and thriving communities? So we, we have seen a number of ideas, clean water, air, um, access to food, more health workers. So what change is needed to get us from where we are to the realization of those ideas that you posted on the first Jamboard. And again, please use the sticky notes to write down your thoughts. Collaboration in communities and at state level without personal agendas. Yes, 
address structural barriers through equitable policies. Absolutely. What else? What other concrete steps? What are some things that your community can do? Invest in local communities based on what communities identify, whoops, as being most in need, I believe as most pressing, informing solutions from a cultural lens. Yes. Come together and work together. In terms of communication with partners and community members, health councils could be trained in and use social marketing techniques and processes. That's a concrete step and that's a great idea. Heart-led leadership at the state level rather than leading on politics and ego, yes. And you know, there are um, examples of that and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So there are ways and methodologies to come together and work together. Need to effectively address climate change locally, statewide and nationally. And I would say another concrete step uh, connected with that is to learn about what each other is doing. New Mexico is incredibly innovative and there are ways to positively affect climate change, but we need to know about them or more people need to know about them. Require accountability of state money invested in medical care. Yes, all state monies have to be accounted for. Think about data disaggregation so that funding can get to communities. Okay, need to, uh, let's see, focus on upstream and structural causes of health disparities. Very good. Changes in power balances between community and institutions. Yes. So there's a number of thing, themes about health equity. And I think, um, New Mexico may need to address its history of colonialism and land appropriation. So let's see, comprehensive approach to health, not compartmentalize, work across agencies. Yes, that would be fantastic. The governor's office led the charge on the food initiative, and she has agencies working together uh, around food and hunger, and the same could be done around health. So knowing that we are coming up on time, I am going to ask you uh, if you have ideas, please continue to post them, but also uh, to switch to the pen and start putting hearts or circles or marks to indicate um, what you think are good ideas. So too many guns, some states or countries have done buybacks of guns so that uh, gun owners aren't uh, losing out financially, and they have an incentive to give up their guns. Ban plastics or place burden for disposable on manufacturers. That's a big one um, because a lot of the manufacturers are out of state and often out of country. Uh, break down silos. That's a great one. Come together and work together. That's breaking down silos, and that's uh, also, you know, working across different agencies and departments and organizations. Okay. Stronger education systems. We need to graduate people ready to hit the ground running and excel in their field. Yes. And um, we also need to rethink how we're doing education. Life has changed since COVID. Focus on upstream and, and structural causes. Yes, we read that. Um, okay. Affordable and safe housing, absolutely. And if you haven't seen it, you can go online and look at 3D printers that are 
building houses out of concrete. So you start with the foundation and they can build a whole house in a day. And then you just need to come in with the plumbing and electrical, it's pretty phenomenal. We are coming up on time. And what is our third slide? And all of this information is going to be shared back to you. What can we accomplish together right now in order to build healthy and thriving communities in New Mexico? And you know what, Valeria? I think we have our answers to that in the previous slides because we need to work together. We need to fully fund health and food and housing. Um, we need to address climate change and we need to address uh, inequities and uh, systemic barriers. So I think we have our answers and I would like to turn this back to you to wrap things up. And thank you everyone for participating. Thank you, Sephora, for that um, very, very beautiful facilitation. Um, and uh, members for staying with us. I know we're running a little over time. We have two more items to our agenda. And to the facilitation, just to reflect, you know, we at NMHC with County and Tribal Health Councils believe that working together across sectors and investing in communities will be key in co-creating the healthiest state in this country, right? Setting new standards. We're only 2.11 million people across the state uh, with state reserves in the billions. And we do have the dedication, expertise, lived experience, wisdom, and clearly resources to ensure that every community member in this state has access to everything that they need to live a happy, healthy, and thriving life. And with that, I'd love to um, uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Debbie Ortiz, Health Council Coordinator at Torrance County Health Council and Chair of the Board at the New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils. Debbie's unwavering leadership and championing of county and tribal health councils has been critical in our collective advocacy efforts uh, this last year. Thank you so much for being here with us, Debbie. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? We're good. Um, I just want to um, be mindful of everyone's time. and But I do want to um, just thank uh, Representative Small, Representative Thompson, Representative Little, and Representative Lujan for joining us today. Um, all of our representatives, um, our governor and um, key partners and other state agencies were invited to attend the summit. Hopefully next week, they will um, be able to make some time to, to join us for the second part of the summit. Um, it, it's just so amazing that um, our executive director, Valeria and her team with the New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils um, were able to um, successfully um, advocate for uh, health councils during the last legislative session and were able to um, um, come up with um, a good idea of uh, funding for health councils and what health councils need. Um, you know, we look at health councils and everything is health. And that was just, um, you know, um, a testament today to um, all of our presenters, our legislators that were on, um, health intersects with everything that we do every single day. And from the water in our communities to our police force, um, you know, if we don't have healthy communities, um, we can't thrive. And so, um, we just appreciate the representatives that were on today to listen to us and to um, uh, be our champions and advocate for us. Um, 
with the other, uh, with your colleagues, with the other legislators, um, senators, and representatives, um, and even the governor. Please advocate for us and for the work that uh, health councils are doing. Um, we're the boots on the ground in our communities. Um, we know we ha we have a pulse on everything that's going on, um, and we're here to serve our communities and. Um, so we just, we would ask that, um, that you continue to advocate for us for recurring funding so that, um, we can, uh, do the work that we're doing in our communities. Um, you know, with the last funding that we received, we were able to, um, add community health workers to our, um, health councils and to our communities. And those have been instrumental in, um, helping us to gather data and information that we can disseminate back to the state um, with when we do our reporting. And so we're just, we're excited about what the future uh, holds in New Mexico for health councils, tribal and county health councils. Um, I wanna thank everyone for taking the time to be on today. And we just um, look forward to moving forward and getting our job done and supporting our communities. Um, that's all I have to say. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Valeria. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you so very much. Um, yes, this is, this is advocacy in action, my friend. This is a call to action. Uh, and of course, uh, enlisting the support of the governor, uh, our legislators, state agencies, DOH to uh, invest in this critical function of public health, that is county and tribal health councils, is the most critical uh, goal this year. So we need um, everyone to join in our collective efforts. Uh, we want to give a big thank you to Encorum Health Foundation uh, for making these summits uh, uh, a reality. We're going to have our next one on Monday. So please feel free to invite your colleagues, your community members, your friends, and of course, NMHC wouldn't be here without the investment and partnership from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, McCune Foundation, Santa Fe County, um, Department of Health, Unida, Synchronous, and so forth. Um, once again, our biggest, biggest thank you, wholehearted thank you um, to our Health Council champions, Representative Anthony Allison, Representative Liz Thompson, Representative Wanda Johnson, Representative Gail Armstrong, Representative Tara Lujan, Representative Derek Lente, Representative Jack Chatfield, and Senator Liz Stefanix for championing this funding bill for this year that got us here to this moment. And the work is not done. We continue. Uh, Want to make sure that we can establish recurring optimal funding to leverage health councils for success in service of our community members around the state. So we invite you to take a look at our advocacy website. We have um, several resources there in ways in which you can join advocacy efforts. Once again, we're gonna follow up with an email, um, including the slide deck, the recording, the jam boards, and some handouts uh, for you to dive deeper into. And we're here to answer any questions that you may have. And so as we draw um, to closing the summit here, I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for your dedication to New Mexico, for your active participation today in the invaluable contributions that you make each and every day. Your passion, insights, and commitment have made this gathering today so meaningful and successful. Uh, we have learned about the important work of County and Tribal Health Councils, shared and explored innovative ideas, forge uh, potential collaboration, new partnerships, and most importantly, reaffirmed our unified goal to improve the health and well-being of our communities, right? The alignment between our community priorities, our shared goals, legislative priorities, governor priorities, and the work of health councils has never been stronger. And I believe that together we are so poised to create lasting, positive, and meaningful change for our communities. So let us carry this energy and inspiration forward from this time that we've had together into our daily work. 
and know that together we do have the power to transform our vision and goals into reality and build a healthier, more equitable future for everyone in New Mexico. Thank you once again for being here, for all that you do, all the ways that you show up. Um, let's continue to take this important work with renewed vigor and drive and commitment. Thank you all for your time, energy, and presence today.